So welcome to the September 26, 2022 Zoning Board of Appeals special meeting of the town of Raymond. The Zoning Board of Appeals will come to order. The board mm. does have a quorum. I am now going to do a roll call. I'll start with myself, David Merch. Craig Dean. Tom Hennessy. Fred Mella. Pete Lockwood. This is a public proceeding, and unless the board specifically votes to go into executive session, you have the right to hear everything that is being said and to look at all of the exhibits that are presented. Please notify the chair if you are unable to see or hear. The board works from a published agenda and will be considering tonight's items in the following order. Call to order. Number two, old business, specifically deliberations on the following matters, taken on August 30th, 2022, administrative appeal, re-notice of violation issued 310-2022, applicant Gregory P. Braun, Esquire on behalf of the Lake Marine. And we will have public hearings in the following matters, table on August 30, 2022, administrative appeal, re-notice of violation issued 128-2022, applicant Lita E. Brachton. <laughs> on behalf of Management Controls LLC and the Administrative Appeal Read Notice of Violation Issue 310 2022, applicant Gregory P. Braun, Esquire, on behalf of Big Lake Marine. Uh, both of those are for location 28 Whitetail Lane. And then we will have adjournment. In each instance, the burden is upon the applicant to demonstrate compliance with the provisions of the applicable ordinances or state law after the vote. Board decides on the merits of each application, it will prepare a written notice of decision because the notice of decision may substantially affect any appeals rights. And also as a matter of courtesy, the board asks that those attending the meeting with regards to a specific application not leave until the board has completed its discussion. Generally speaking, appeals from adverse decisions must be filed with the superior court as otherwise provided by law within 45 days of this board's decision. Also, to be certain that you preserve your individual rights to file any such appeal, you must be certain that the board's record evidences your appearances this evening in opposition and the basis for your opposition. All persons speaking, including representatives of the applicant and members of the public, are asked to state their name, their address, and affiliation with the application, either being for, opposed, or neutral. All persons speaking shall address all remarks or questions to the chair. This meeting is not over until the board has formally adjourned. Any discussions not included on the meeting agenda or accepted by the board is to be held until after adjournment or conducted outside of the meeting. So as we've gone through our call to order, we are now moving on to old business. And again, deliberations on the following matters tabled on August 30th, 2022, an administrative appeal, read a notice of violation issued on 3-10-2022. Applicant Gregory P. Braun, Esquire, on behalf of Big Lake Marine, LLC, Robert Durant, member and management. Location 18 Fernwood Road, description, administrative appeal from notice of violation. So uh, attorney Wagner, you have been assisting our board with these matters. If you would uh, sort of further assist by kind of taking us through these next steps. Sure. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, just a <clears throat> quick heads up. I'm working on a, a laptop remotely, so I, I don't have my normal uh, uh, size screen. So I'm actually going to be switching through. So it, if you're used to me being able to read your facial expressions to respond, uh, you'll just have to shout if it looks like I'm not looking at you, because I'm probably not. Um, so with that, uh, the remaining item of business for uh, this appeal, uh, the 18 for Fern 1 for Big Lake Marine, uh, at the last meeting, uh, members Merch, Lockwood, and Miller uh, opened and closed the public hearing and reached a tentative uh, decision to uh, deny the appeal in part and grant the appeal in part. Uh, and I have prepared a written decision summarizing the uh, findings and conclusions that the board uh, made. And I circulated that earlier today. Um, so my recommendation is that for this, uh, for reviewing this and uh, voting on it uh, to issue the final decision, 
uh, on this appeal. We keep it to just members Lur uh, Merch, Lockwood, and Miller. Uh, is everybody on the board okay with that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, I just have one question, Attorney Wagner. Do, do you want us to catch any typos or? Uh, sh sure. Yeah. Yeah. Please, please go ahead. Uh, and nothing of, uh, nothing of big content. Just no. Un understood. I I was uh, under the gun on that one, so I apologize. Um, and I certainly appreciate uh, you flagging those. And I'll, uh, as we have before, make uh, any changes and circulate that around tomorrow so it could be signed. Stephen, if it's merely typos, I can fix those tomorrow for you and have okay. a command. I, I, I if appreciate there's substance, that. <laughs> then it's to you. I, I appreciate that. Of course. Uh, so uh, it, have the members had a, a chance to read the uh, draft decision? I did review it, uh, review it. It had one correction that I believe needs to be made. It was for item six, mm -hmm. whether violation seven should be vacated. Um, that was a um, two, two, one, zero oh decision. Um, this specifically, it was um, talking about the clearing and removal of vegetation under three inches within 100 feet of uh, normal high water line. Uh, that was the one where I, I didn't believe that the town provided enough evidence that uh, the appellant had, had cleared the vegetation. So I, okay. that was the dissenting. Yeah. Did I, uh, actually, did I accurately capture the vote on the next item, number seven, where I have it as a 210? Yes, that one is correct. Okay. So both of those were a 210. Outside of that, I didn't, I didn't notice anything else. Any uh, further comments or corrections from the members? I have nothing. Um, yeah, Steve, if you could just kind of, in uh, item number seven, violation eight, if we could just take a quick look at the uh, second to last paragraph where it says a minority of the board finds that the town did not submit sufficient evidence to show it was BLM that was responsible for obtaining the permits. I was just wondering why it was worded that way instead of a majority of the board did think, you know, I'm just just curious the way the, the way that the vote went. Uh, sh sure. I, uh, the intent was to uh, just reflect the uh, views of uh, Chairman Merch and his, his reasoning, but uh, I, I agree. I could state it in the, uh, uh, from the perspective of the majority and uh, reword it. I'm fine. I just wanted to make sure I understood it. Tom, did you have something with this? Just uh, from the <laughs> typos perspective? There was, um, I'm trying to find it. There was one or two that deal with the vegetation. And, and I thought when I read this the first time through, the word violation was there where vegetation belonged in the paragraph. Okay, I will make a note to run through that. Appreciate you flagging. Oh, uh, yeah. I see that as well, Tom. <laughs> Stephen, would you like me to just fix those two minor things tomorrow? Uh, no, I'll, I'll run through it, Sandy. Okay. I appreciate that, though. Of course. Yeah. Uh, so if there's nothing further, then I would suggest a, a motion to... Uh, Pass the decision as rant uh, as written, uh, subject to those modifications. So moved. Do I have a second? I'll second it. Okay. Do we have any further discussion? Yep. All those in favor? Uh, David Birch, yes. And Miller, yes. Steve Lockwood, yes. All those opposed? All those abstaining? 
Greg, no. Are, are we supposed to abstain? Yeah, yeah why, why don't we we'll, we'll mark you as abstention, sure. That's it. Okay. So that's everything on that matter. So I turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Take over. So <clears throat> moving on, public hearings and the following matters to live on August 30, 2022. Administrative appeal, reading notice of violation issued 128 2022. We also have a follow up uh, administrative appeal, reading notice of violation issued 310 2022. Um, both of these were tabled. Um, so I need a motion to take these both off of the table. So move. Second. Second. Mm -hmm. For the conversation. All those in favor of taking these off the table, David Rich, yes. Greg Dean, yes. Tom Hennessy, yes. Ed Miller, yes. Reed Lockwood, yes. Uh, so the first one we will address is the administrative appeal from the notice of violation issued 128 2022. Ravi Rajan Esquire on behalf of Management Controls LLC, location 28 Whitetail Lane, description administrative appeal from notice of violation. So, again, Attorney Wagner. Great to assist us as we go through these. Uh, can you sort of lead us again through the process? We should be taking. Sure. Thank you, uh, Chairman Merch. So uh, we'll follow the same process uh, that we have on the uh, prior appeals. So this is a, a de novo hearing. Uh, the board can accept that. Uh, must accept new evidence. The applicant has the burden. Uh, you undertake your own independent investigation of the evidence and law. Uh, and I, I suggest that we take the issues uh, step by step as raised in the um, uh, written notice of appeal and as framed by the uh, attorneys. And I'll, I'll guide you through that. Um, uh, we've already established a quorum and we're back to the full uh, membership here. <clears throat> and I'll uh, represent that you have uh, jurisdiction uh, for this, and the appeal has been uh, timely followed, uh, sorry, timely filed, and the applicant has standing. Uh, I assume the board agrees with that. Seeing yes. Good. Okay, uh, so... Uh, as we have before, uh, if anybody has a conflict of interest or bias, they would like to uh, discuss or raise or any objections uh, based on conflict of interest or bias, those should be uh, discussed now. Nothing. Okay. And the record will note the uh, prior conflict uh, uh, that was raised uh, previously. <clears throat> Uh, so as before, the sequence of presentations uh, will begin with the uh, appellant without interruption, followed by questions by the board for the appellant, and then questions by the uh, town and other parties uh, for the appellant's witnesses. Uh, and then we'll turn it over to the town and follow that same order. Uh, so with that, Mr. Chair, I recommend you uh, pass it over to attorney Rachel. So, Attorney Rachel, it is uh, our pleasure to hear what you have to say. Great. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, fellow um, council. As you know, my name is Leah Rachel, and I am here on behalf of Management Control. Um, just as, as a threshold logistic issue, I just wanted to make sure um, it's been written in all of the decisions, and I think that all of the parties council agree that the record for one case is the record for all. Um, and so to that end, I did submit earlier today, just so that we have everything consolidated into one repository of information, the record of all of those documents that at least from, from uh, my clients have been submitted in the prior appeals and also those that I will be relying upon today. So I just wanted to make sure first and foremost that, that folks receive those and that those are, um, you know, I understand perhaps that as we go through that um, there may be some objections to that, but they'll be handled as we go. But I did want to confirm that, that everyone received those records or documents, I should say. I did, yes. 
just to just to clarify, this is the um, you're referencing the DWM law share uh, link that was shared. Correct. Okay. Yep. And that's more for the purposes of of Sandy actually to keep the record. Um, I nothing. I didn't add anything to what was already before the board, but I also included those things that I will be discussing today. But when I'm sc uh, screen sharing, I will have those documents also readily available so that I can walk the board members through as I go, okay? All right then, so turning to the merits, obviously this is not the first time that we have met. Um, you've heard lots of testimony, you have heard lots of argument, you've reviewed lots of documents. But I think it's really critical to emphasize before we get into the meat and potatoes of what we're doing tonight is that we're dealing with whitetail and whitetail is a very different property than Fernwood and so I would ask of you to keep that firmly in mind. As far as the differences, and I think actually those differences are well reflected in the documents submitted by the code enforcement officer himself, that um, the bottom line is that the original state of this property and all of those before pictures, you will see that this property already had extensive riprap um, on it. And so this, as I said, is a different, it's a different property, different considerations. The other thing that I think is very critical to bear in mind is that, again, the code officers before pictures very much demonstrated there was an existing beach on this property. Um, another piece that is different from Fernwood is that only a portion of the shorefront here on the Whitetail property was impacted, and um, less than 100, 100 feet of that shore, shoreline um, was affected whereby there was actually a permit by rule that was sought for that that portion of less than 100 feet. There's another small stretch, and we'll be talking about this as I go through, but that there was existing riprap, and all that was done essentially was to add some riprap on top of the existing riprap, which in essence is really maintenance of the existing riprap. And finally, it's also important to note that a very large portion of the property and the shoreline was not disturbed at all. So again, different property, different factors, and I would just ask that you be mindful of those things. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so as is the case with our prior appeals, I, I just wanna talk about there's some themes here at play and I'll round those out a little bit more fully, but just to set the stage, the first, of course, is that this notice of violation was issued to the wrong person. We've talked about that before and I'll get into it a little bit more. Um, the second, of course, is the duplication of the various violations. And it's our submission that it really is just a blatant overreach and an attempt to increase fines, um, both collectively as to the number of parties who are being tagged for the same violation, and also, um, even within the violation itself, you'll see that um, there are num numerous violations that are actually related to the same exact activity and the same exact um, provision of the, the Shoreland Zoning Ordinance, which is purported to be violated, is cited for multiple violations. And so um, I know you've heard this before, but I just wanted to reiterate that this is clearly a tremendous amount of duplication that is unnecessary here. The next piece, and we'll get into this more um, as I examine the witnesses here, is that the evidence simply does not support a conclusion that a number of the alleged violations actually occurred. And we'll get into that as we move through. Um, another thing to keep in mind, is that the notices of violation, all of them here, that's just a characteristic of any notice of violation, in addition to outlining what the um, alleged violations are themselves, another critical component of that is to talk about the corrective measures or corrective actions that will be required. And it's important to understand here that um, almost immediately when my client became aware that there was a violation, they um, reached out to the DEP, to the town, talked about how, okay, we need to remedy this. And in fact, hired an expert to do that, who submitted several after the fact permits to rectify. Um, again, we're not admitting that, that there were in fact violations, but in order to work with the town and to make sure that we were addressing concerns, did that for whatever reason, the town found that particular expert's submissions to be unacceptable, not, 
um, in any way conceding to the fact that that's the case. Again, in an effort to satisfy the town that we were taking all necessary steps to um, have a, a, a property that was in compliance, retained another uh, engineering firm to submit a an application for the restoration work, for um, various after the fact permits, again, that was rejected. So we have been trying at every turn to meet the town's expectations and at every turn we have been rebuffed. And so I just wanted to make sure that that was also clear for context. So back to the argument of the wrong person, okay? Um, I wanted to, I'm gonna bring up, am I able to, um, can you allow me to screen share please? Can I do that? The chair's perspective, yes. You are, okay. You certainly do. And are you able to see these submissions here? Yes. Okay. And so right here, I just wanted to focus in on this. The document you've seen before, but it bears emphasis that this, as you will see, is the contract before between Big Lake Marine and my client management controls. And this is with respect to the White Trail property. As you can see, the very first entry, the very first requirement of this contract that is that Big Lake Marine will obtain all necessary permitting from the town and DEP. That was an extremely important criteria for my client. It was clearly specified right up front. It was the primary obligation. And as we know, unfortunately, we're here, that was not met. And it's also critical to understand that my client reached out to who they thought was the premier um, shoreline contractor in the area. And here, are you able to see my screen here? I just wanna make sure you can see that this is an excerpt from Big Lake Marine's website. You can see that? Yes, okay. And so clearly what we do, Big Lake has become the premier waterfront service company and offers a variety of services. Um, so relying on a contractor who's the premier waterfront service com company, and again, the first thing of what they do, permitting services, state and local. So again, just to emphasize that um, my client reasonably relied on the contractor to in fact secure these permits. <laughs> Excuse me. So, the second argument that we have talked about before, but I also want to make sure that we we talk about it again, is the duplicative nature of the various violations. I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a moment. Um, as with the firm, Fernwood property, the NOVs relating to Whitetail are replete with examples of overreach and duplication. And when, you know, as I said, look at both collectively and um, individually, that it's very clear that you know the town is attempting to get fines for you know to exponentially increase the amount of fines that they could they could get by essentially duplicating um, uh, excuse me duplicating violations that in fact really should be consolidated and we've talked about this before I'm going to say it again why does this matter you know it's really important to understand that we're not here simply just to parse uh, an NOV the reason why we're here is because the stakes are very high. Um, as you may, are maybe well aware, the town is threatening uh, fines in excess of, at this point, I think it's $2 million, and according to the town, those are, those are accruing every single day. We disagree with that, but yet that's the town's position. And so, um, you know, that, that's why we're here. We want to basically make clear that this attempt to artificially inflate both the number of violations and the extent of these violations, um, and especially by refusing to even entertain our after-the-fact permits, were, which were the very requirement of the corrective action, is just really problematic and very much unfair. And so that's the context in which we are, we're, we're, we're dealing with these issues. And I want to make sure that everybody's aware of that. <clears throat> and so, I can go through at this point, and actually I think for purposes, I may, I may just um, hold this off to our summation as to the consolidation and what the request is there for, for consolidation. That probably is the most efficient way of going. Um, but the, the third thing that we want to talk about is, as I said, the fact that some of these alleged, in fact, many of these alleged violations are not, in fact, violations, and the evidence will show that 
hopefully, and then we, we submit it well throughout these pr proceedings. Um, and so what I'd like to do is actually call the first witness to go on and basically put on evidence as to why the um, notices of the violation and the alleged violations simply are not substantiated. That would be fine from the chair. Okay. And so in that regard, I'd like to actually call um, Alex Theroy as our first witness. Yep. May I proceed? My perspective, yes. Thank you. And so, um, Alex, can I call you Alex? I know we've been doing this quite a bit. Are we there yet? Sure can. can I call you Alex? Yeah. Okay. I think so, yeah. And we know you are the code enforcement officer. Yep. And I think we did talk a little bit about your educational background, but just, just refresh our memory if you would. Uh, yeah, I'm a state certified uh, code enforcement officer. And as far as your um, undergrad background, can you yep. discuss that? I have a bachelor's in communications. And do you have any degrees or certificates in environmental engineering? Uh, I do not have a uh, degree in any type of uh, environmental engineering, just through the state certification process. Okay. And how about, same question for, what about surveying? Uh, same, same answer. I don't have any um, degrees or anything in surveying. And what about geology? Nope. And civil engineering? Nope. Okay. And so can you tell us a bit about when you actually first became aware of the work that was happening at the Whitetail property? Uh, yeah, October 14th, 2021. And how did you become aware of that? Uh, we received multiple emails, uh, the first of which from Alexis Avalos from DEP and the second from the uh, deputy fire chief. Okay. And, and what was the concern of the fire chief? I'm not sure we've heard about that before. Yeah, they actually drove by the property on the fireboat later on in the afternoon. And, and from a fire safety or emergency services perspective, is that something that they were concerned about? It was more just a head, head, heads up, this is happening. Yeah, I think they noticed it and it was clearly something that didn't seem right in their eyes. Okay, so you noticed, I think you said you got some emails on the 14th of October. When did you actually attend at the property? Uh, I believe, Without having it in front of me, the date's in front of me, I believe it was October 26th. Okay. And who was there with you? We met with uh, DEP, both Jeff Kalinich and Alexis Savavalos. We also um, met with, at the same time, uh, Rob Durant uh, and uh, Nathan Whalen from the Portland Water District. I believe that was everyone. Got it. Okay. And so when you did go on site, what equipment did you bring with you, if any? Um, uh, equipment, I think I probably just had my phones. That was probably it. Okay. And um, have you ever obtained a survey for this property, the town? Uh, uh, I'm in receipt of a survey of this property, which was given to us by uh, either the property owner or his uh, engineer. Okay, and are you referring perhaps to the, I'm just going to bring it up, I'm going to scare, sorry, share my screen if I can. You able to see it? Yeah. Just so we're talking about the same thing, is this the, the survey that you're referring to? I believe so. Okay, I'll just, I'll make it smaller. And, and in fact, it's not just a survey, but this actually indicates that it was approved by the town's planning board as a subdivision plan. Do you agree with that? I'm looking, scrolling uh, yep, up here. There's, yep. there's a signature Yep, that's block. the subdivision plan. Yep. yep. And so it's both a survey. Can we agree that it's both a survey and the subdivision, an approved subdivision plan? Uh, it does appear to be without reading all the notes, but it, it looks right. as though it is. Okay. All right. Thanks. There's also a more recent one that I've seen uh, since that shows the shorefront um, prior to the work that's been completed and then it also shows a shoreline after the work that was completed. Okay, all right. Um, so when you were at the property that day on October 26th, I think, think you said, with all those folks from DEP and, and Durant and his representatives, did you actually consult a survey uh, of the property that day? Did you have a survey with you? Uh, no, we didn't. I didn't have that. Then the survey I just mentioned, um, 
you know, the subdivision plan we had on the file, um, but the survey that showed the normal high water mark prior to uh, work and after work, uh, I think I was just given that like three or four months ago. Okay, thank you. And then when you were actually um, drafting your notice of violation, did you have that survey plan, the 2007 plan with Yes, you? yeah. We did review that before issuing the NOV. Okay. All right. And when you actually were preparing to go to the site, did you do any preparation? Did you speak with anybody about, you know, what it was that your task was or? Um, I, can you be more specific? Uh, I would say yes, but I don't think that's the answer you're looking for. Okay. Well, I guess, let me drill down a little bit. So who, with whom did you speak in preparation for that meeting? Um, I think I spoke with my assistant, Chris, and my town manager. Um, I think we also may have, I can't remember if we spoke on the phone with folks from DEP or not prior to, I can't remember. I don't think we did. Okay. And to the extent that you can recall, can you tell me a bit, of, or the board, especially about the substance of those conversations? Um, just that, uh, you know, we felt it was based on the photos, it was a very serious violation. And, uh, it was definitely one that we were going to need to, uh, likely retain legal counsel for, and, uh, we may have, I don't actually, you know what, I don't think we did speak with the attorney prior to, because I think we had inspection photos when we spoke with um, the town's attorney uh, and realized that there was a conflict. So uh, yeah, that wasn't prior to that site meeting. Okay. All right. And so um, were you able to determine when work actually commenced? And Durant was um, there, correct? I mean, he was on site. Did he, did you yeah. get a sense of when that work commenced? Um, well, no, what I do know is the before photo taken from the drone was taken in August. Um, that was, so I know, you, let me just be clear. The, the drone photos that was taken by the, um, the Portland water district, correct? Yeah. Yep, okay. Correct. So fairly soon. Uh, if, if those were taken in August, you attended on the property or heard that was, there were, there was some um, work being done in October. So, uh, fair to say so at some point in sep September, early October. Yes. Yeah. I would say that's fair. Okay. And do you have any sense of how many days it continued? Um, from what I can tell, work stopped um, at least by the day that we visited the site on October 26th. Um, okay, but let me just be clear. You had said that you had been told or been notified by folks on October 14th. You attended on the 26th. Are you yep. aware uh, do you believe that any work was conducted between October 14th and the 26th? I do think so, yeah. And what leads you to that conclusion? Uh, just based on the photos that we received from DEP um, and what the site looked like when I visited it on the 26th. Um, when we got to the site, uh, it looks as though it basically does today. Nothing's changed from that day. Uh, okay. I don't believe any work's happened since, but uh, I don't know that, you know, I, I don't know that work didn't happen between October 14th and the 26th is what okay. I'm saying. Okay, fair enough. And, and just to put a finer point on it, when you became aware on October 14th that this work was happening because you were notified by others, did you reach out to either the property owner or Durant to say, hey, hold the phone? Or uh, you obviously had some communication because you had to set up this meeting on the 26th. Can you... Tell yeah, that. that was the conversation. It was, uh, you know, definitely need to hold up. Uh, there's no town permit uh, and we need to meet on site ASAP. And when was, uh, do you have a sense of when as between the October 14th and the 26th that conversation happened? I don't know off the top of my head. I could look, but um, it, it was pretty quick. I, either on the 14th or the next day, it was pretty quick after that. Okay, and at some point you issued what we could call a verbal stop work order, basically stop. Yeah. And you, can you pinpoint roughly when that was? I believe it was that week, the week of the 14th. Okay, okay. And um, that stop work order has remained in place? Uh, no, there has been a, a demo permit issued for both properties. Uh, I, I understand. I should say, when you say demo permit, just to clarify, that was with respect to the house, at, like internal to the house, correct? And the hot tub area for Brentwood. But yeah. nothing with respect to the riprap, the, the, the stabilization work, correct? Correct, yeah. Okay. All right. And I think you said, and you 
you'll correct me if I misunderstood you, that since that um, you basically said stop all work in that in that um, the shore shoreline area, that has been abided by, correct? Yes. I think you mentioned you did not take the before shots. Everything in your submissions with respect to your exhibits, to your notice of violation, all of those photos, as far as you know, were taken by the Portland Water District, correct? Um, the before photos are all from the Portland Water District, yes. Okay. And when you, uh, and, and then a lot of the after photos that are so called in your notice of violation, and I think it's in the slideshow, those were all taken by you? Um, either by myself or uh, submitted to us from DEP. Okay. And the ones that were taken by you, did you actually make an effort to take them from the same angle, same perspective as those that were um, taken by the, the water district? No, I actually hadn't seen most of the Portland water district photos that first time we were on site. Okay. Actually, I was given it that actually that day uh, Nathan gave us the uh, drone photo that afternoon. That day, meaning the 26th? Yes. Thank correct. you. Okay, understood. All right, and so just as a general proposition, I'm not talking about this notice of violation, I'm talking about notices of violation generally. That's the world you live in, right? Um, mm -hmm. Is it fair to say that the purpose is at least twofold? First, is to very clearly identify for the alleged violator those, th the violations, basically what they did wrong basically say to them, hey, this is what the problem is, right? Is that a fair yep. characterization? And then yep. the second equally important part of those notices is to identify what they have to do to correct those alleged violations. And in essence, how they can come back into compliance, correct? Yep. Okay. All right. So let's then go, let's go to the notice of violation. Start working our way through that. And I'm going to share my screen if I can. Okay, so just with respect to this first violation, violation number one, and this is for filling an earth moving in more than 10 cubic yards, correct? Yep. And I'm reading from this notice notice of violation that basically the premise here is that there was a significant amount of soil disturbance, correct? Within 100 feet of the normal high water line? Yeah. Okay. And what efforts did you make to actually determine where that normal high water line was? Uh, observe change in vegetation. Uh, visually is, is what we would look for um, in a situation like this. Uh, that normal high water mark uh, would usually be set by a state licensed surveyor. Okay. Um, but you didn't have a, So you were doing it by vis, visual indicators. You didn't have a survey yourself, correct? Yeah, that 100 foot distance that I am mentioning is based on the water line observed that day. Okay. All right. And um, how did you measure? How did you measure it out? Did you actually use any equipment or it was all just visual from your perspective? Um, the approximate distances were measured um, through just the uh, measure app um, on a cell phone. I'm not familiar with that. Can you walk me through what that means and how you use it? Yeah, so basically any iPhone uh, has a uh, distance measurement tool included with it that's um, you know, not 100% accurate, but is usually pretty close within a foot at least. Okay. Uh, and for situations like this, uh, it's a quick, easy way to, to get an approximate measurement. Okay. And tell me this, um, you know, we're dealing with volumes of material like mm -hmm. uh, loam and, and riprap, correct? So yep. tell me how, what did you use to actually measure the amount of, you know, a, a supposed loam and, and riprap? How did you come up with that calculation that was um, more than 10 cubic yards? Um, I just based it on uh, two inches. Uh, I mean, if someone had gone along and just pulled back all the grass, which was basically what was done on Whitetail. Um, all of the grass was uh, ripped up uh, to the left of the house and along the shorefront. Uh, if you take a 50 by 50 foot area um, at two inches deep, uh, that exceeds 10 cubic yards. And how do you know it was two inches deep? Did you measure? Uh, it definitely just kicking with my toe in the ground. That's how much moved around. I think it's pretty clear that um, just with that alone, they exceed it. And then you 
add in all of the riprap that was uh, deposited on site and the um, mulch that was put on the berms you know, around the banks. Um, they probably well over, uh, you know, hundreds of cubic yards at that point. Did you, um, so you didn't, you didn't actually measure, you said you toe kicked, right? What about with the riprap? Did you toe kick the riprap? Uh, no, no, I definitely didn't, but uh, I think it's it's pretty clear based on the height of that riprap and the length. Um, you know, those numbers could easily be added up to calculate um, based on the you know diameter of the rocks that was added uh, mm -hmm. that they greatly exceeded ten cubic yards. And and you had mentioned how they had ripped up the lawn, and I and when I'm, when we're talking about the lawn, I'm just gonna. Let me go to some of these exhibits here so we'll make sure that we're talking about the same place. Um, so, bear with me. When you're speaking about this ripped up lawn area, is it this area, um, if I'm looking at the house from the water on the left hand side, is that what you're talking about there? Yeah. Okay. And so are you aware that that is where the staging area was for all of the equipment that? Um... Yeah, that would make sense. And so basically just traveling back and forth in that area um, could possibly damage. And I'm looking at this lawn area, it's certainly, at least from my perspective, you've got some black blank patches here. This is just, it, it's certainly not a manicured lawn. Would you agree with that? Yeah. And would you agree that by, you know, basically using equipment that that's going to possibly damage um, some of that area, but it's not an actual act of physically ripping up the, uh, the lawn, is that fair to say? Um, I don't know. If you look at the after photos, it looks pretty well graded to me. I mean, I'm not seeing any large ruts. I don't know if you could point to any that you're seeing for where equipment may have been parked. Um, you know, there's also a very significant difference when it comes to the rules on what's allowed when there's a permit issued and not. Um, you know, if a permit had been issued for this activity, it's possible they could have used it as a staging area. Uh, and, you know, it wouldn't be uh, necessarily considered a violation at that point. Okay. And I'm looking, you know, again, I'm looking at your exhibit A here where this area is. And I see. You know, there's still plenty of area. I mean, if you look, can you see where my cursor is here? Yep. So we've got leaf litter. We've got, looks like little pieces of lawn here and here that are just coming up through. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? Do you, do you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, I think you could see that if you look hard enough. Mm -hmm. But you can see it, is what I hear you say. Yeah, I mean, the, the issue is if you look back at the NOV, the, this particular violation is not as much about volume and, and you know disturbance. It's really more about this activity taking place without an approved erosion control plan, um, which I think is the real issue here is, you know, this work should have had an approved erosion, an erosion control plan in place, permitted or not. Uh, and they did have erosion control on site, but there's no approved plan. So let's um, talk about, let's talk about that for a minute. Um, you're aware that uh, various PBRs or permit by rule applications were applied for, correct? Uh, yes. And part of that, and I, this is the one, actually there were three for the different properties. So let me get to the one for Whitetail, okay? So this mm -hmm. was applied for. And part of the description talks about how there's erosion control measures per DEP requirements, correct? Mm-hmm. And you see that right here on the form. Yeah. And I believe in the notice of violation, we talk about um, best management practices for erosion control uh, that are based on DEPs, regs, is that correct? Uh, based on the main erosion control BMPs uh, for Bureau of Land and Water Quality, Main Department of Environmental Protection, and would March the, 2003. Would those not be the same best management practices that would have to be used in conjunction with a permit by rule? I uh, could be. I'm not sure. I I don't um, enforce enforce NERPA, so I'm not exactly sure what it is they look at. To be honest. Okay, so it is fair to say that you know, with respect to that permit by rule, that they were following erosion control best management practices in conjunction with that permit. 
Yeah, but the section of the ordinance, I guess if I'm going to disagree, doesn't say that, um, you know, they just need to get a, a you know, a file for a permit by rule. Um, the town wasn't ever given a copy of this um, erosion control plan that they had prepared uh, at the time of this um, you know, particular violation taking place. Okay. Uh, and I think that's the difference here for, for us. And, and just following up on, I think, I think there was some testimony in past hearings about um, in, in part of your materials, there were some pictures of, of silt fences kind of not rooted down into the, um, into the riprap and that, that were possibly, you know, not, not secured sufficiently. Correct. Do you remember that? Yeah. Um, but I think you had said that work had stopped and those pictures were taken after the work had stopped, correct? So that could have just happened when folks weren't there every day after the work had actually stopped. Um, I would go to page 16 of the NOV mm -hmm. um, where there's active work taking place on site and you can see uh, there's a section where the silt fence is on the ground about 25 feet or so from which looks like an excavator. Can I just uh, ask, Alex, so we, everyone's looking at the same thing. Um, when you say mm -hmm. page 16, I don't have pages. I have exhibits. So. Yeah, it would be um, exhibit uh, E. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this photo right here. Right. And when was that photo taken? That I'm not sure. This was one of the photos that was given to us from Alexis. I would assume this was taken on October 14th, the same day she took the photo of Fernwood. Um, but here you can see, uh, this is the time where we would want the silt fence in place the most because you've got all that soil on the bank. Um, and if we got a substantial afternoon rainstorm, that's all headed into the lake. Okay, but you don't know, I think I heard you say you don't know exactly when that picture was taken, correct? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not necessarily understanding why that would matter, I guess, is what I'm saying. Okay. Um, all right, let's move on to the second violation, violation number two, okay? So essentially, the, t the, the violation number one is filling an earth moving of more than 10 cubic yards, correct? Yep. Violation two is the same activity, filling and irving, excuse me, filling and earth moving of more than 10 cubic yards without a permit, correct? Yeah, correct. And, and so it's basically, in essence, it's the same activity we're talking about with respect to violation number one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, essentially, we just did that to, um, I like to do that to make it easier for people to break down the areas of the project where activity is taking place. So this is, again, in that same activity, however, the first section was for the lack of the erosion control plan. The second section is actually the violation for doing the work without the permit. Okay, so let me, when you say section, we're talking about the section of the notice of violation, not the section of the shoreline, right? Just to be clear. The section of the shoreland zoning provisions specifically right. okay. that they're in violation of. Okay, but all right, so it is, I heard you say it's the same activity. And, you know, I already asked you lots of questions about violation number one. You are under the, you are aware of your obligation to tell the truth with, with respect yeah. to the answers. And um, you're, you testified truthfully with respect to those um, questions I asked you, correct? Mm -hmm. And so um, if I were to ask you similar questions based on the same activity for violation number two, would your answers be the same? Would they be the same? Is that what you said? Yes, with respect yes. to... Yeah, yeah. Okay, and so I'll, I'll, I'll move on then so we don't have to... Yeah. Um, so with respect to violation number three, this is Piers Dog, um, Wharves, Bridges, and this is with respect to the boat launch, okay? Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to direct your attention to Exhibit B, which is the photographs that you submitted in support of your allegation that the boat launch was expanded, correct? Yep. Okay. And so in that regard, I just want to make sure that um, this heading relates only, this violation number three relates only to the, the boat launch area, correct? Uh, let me just take a look. Uh, yes. Okay. That is correct. All right. And so we're not talking about construction here. We're, we're focusing, I think your words were expansion or enlargement, correct? Yeah. And so there's an acknowledgement implicitly that this was a pre-existing boat launch area. And you can see it here. Um, you know, you see that area 
here and, and here. Yep. Okay. Yep. And did you determine the high water line um, relative to this violation? Um, no, nope, the high water line would have been determined on, on site, just visually. And that would be probably best displayed by the after photo. And but you were before. saying you did it in the same way. It was by it wasn't by measuring, you didn't have a tape measure, it was by correct. visual inspection, correct? Yes. Okay. And the violation itself, going back to it, it talks about expanding or extending, excuse me, extending over or below the normal high water line, correct? Uh yeah, expanded at or below. Okay. And so how much was it expanded over or below the normal high water mark? Um, well, the the language there is um, expanded at or below. So we know it was definitely expanded at the normal high water line that we, um, you know, inspected the day of. Um, which is clearly shown, I believe, in the before photos where you see two pallets end to end, um, and then the uh, the boat okay, launch uh, that exists. Uh, Alex, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not following. Say that again. In the before photos where you see what? Yeah, so if you look at the um, the boat launch, if you want to call it that, on in the before photos, uh, it was a old wooden structure mm -hmm. that was... Uh, and you're referring to this, which I have my cursor mm -hmm. on, correct? Yep, which looks like two wooden pallets end to end um and what's there now is no longer wooden it's uh you know made out of riprap but, but is there anything i don't think in your notice of violation you made any distinction about materials it was just the expansion of the area correct yeah the use yeah. okay and so you know as i said we're talking about a use that's extending um over or below how or below at or below at, not over at, okay i'm sorry i, I think mm -hmm. the language is over or below if we're looking at the language but i don't want to i don't want to we don't need to um yeah yeah but but exact I, I i'm trying to determine you know in your notice of violation you talk about how it, it it was expanded in this way so i'm trying to understand by how much exactly how much was it expanded uh i would say it's approximately uh 16 feet wide now and was from what uh, DEP um, and uh, myself have been able to determine probably no wider than eight feet before. Unfortunately, we don't know exactly how wide the previous uh, wooden boat launch was because it's no longer there. So you don't you don't have precise measurements for how big it was at the time, correct? We I'm don't have precise object. measurements I'm for how big it was. Object. I'm going to object to that. He just testified, and you can't contradict his testimony because you don't like it. I'm not aware I was actually doing that. But bottom line is, I had asked him what was the degree of expansion. I heard him say he did not have measurements from before. And so by definition, it's difficult to understand how far it's been expanded. He said he estimated it was eight feet. I believe we okay. actually used this photo right here. This is the one that Jeff Kalinich and I had actually talked about um, because we looked at the stairs. Um, there's no way that set of stairs to the left is any larger than six feet or eight feet. Um, and it looks to be just slightly smaller than that, um, you know, boat launch. So by that, we figured there's no way this thing was any larger than 10. And we figured it was probably around eight. So let me just, uh, may, I, I need to catch up with you, Alex. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about this set of stairs here, correct? Yep. Yep. And you estimated that to be six, six feet or so? We figured it was no wider than six, um, and that's based on you know average aluminum uh, dock stairs okay. like that are no more. No, usually four feet. Four feet's the allowed width. So okay. we said, so, okay, maybe they're six. Being generous, six feet, fine. So we're going to move along to here, which is the expanse of the boat launch already. Correct? Yep. I'm not sure how you're getting. I don't, we don't need to we don't need to sticker around this but the bottom line is you did not have well i mean I, I do think it's important i think what you're trying to say is we we can't prove that it's been expanded is that what you're trying to say i am not trying to say anything i'm asking you questions about what your measurements were based on 
yeah, about so, how it has expanded. Okay, so then to answer that question, we based it on photographic evidence from the site previously existing prior to the work. We used uh, our opinion based on the uh, stairs and what looked like a rowboat we figured at the top of the dock um, and used that to kind of estimate what we believe. So that, that was how was. you were scaling it out, so to speak. Yeah, unfortunately, we were never invited to the site prior to the work being done, which had we, we probably could have, but we weren't, and as you know. Okay. And these drone photos, right? These are the drone photos, the before ones, correct? Uh, that's a drone photo. The, the photo we were just looking at actually was taken from the water um, by a Portland Water District intern. I believe that was 2000, I don't can't remember the year, 2014, maybe that one. Okay. But this is the drone photo. This is um, August, yeah. And they don't come with any scale or anything like that. So you're just making your best guess, essentially. Um, we actually may be able to do that. I can I can find out about that. I know the company has specific uh, GPS coordinates on everything. Um, right here, right here, right now, you don't know, correct? No, no, and no. when you were issuing your notice of violation, you did not know? No, nope, just based it on like I explained a minute ago. Okay, fair enough. All right, um, moving on to violation number four. So... Once again, this is um, based on the same provision of the ordinance, the land use table. It talks about piers and docks and wharves, but in this case, we're talking not about the boat launch, but the shoreline itself, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I'm just going to go to that table. Bear with me here. Okay. And so we're talking about this section here. This is the land use table, correct? And this is the yeah. provision 17 that we're, we're talking about. And so yeah. just from a conceptual standpoint, when we're talking about land use tables, the, the point of these is basically to talk about, basically it enumerates the list of the various kinds of uses or structures that either here are allowed, not allowed, and then it specifies who the appropriate uh, authority is to, to grant a permit in that case, correct? Mm-hmm. Okay. And so, Subsection 17, it references piers and docks and wharves and bridges and other structures and uses, right? Extending over and below the normal high yep. water line. I don't see it saying the shoreline itself is a use or a structure. Is it your submission that it is, in fact, a structure or a use? Um, let me hear. Let me just take a look here. I want to see where you're at. Uh, sure, right you're here. At, and this is in four, right? Um, this is section 14, table of land uses. This is what you, yes, yeah. you are no, it is violation four, four correct? Yeah, so, you, so what, what we're looking at here is the area where that boat launch um, previously uh, existed has been expanded. And this is where you were getting at, getting to a second ago, um, below um, the, the uh, normal high water mark as we uh, found it. And... Oh. So, Alex, let me just stop you there. I want to be real clear on this. Are you saying mm -hmm. that the only aspect of the shoreline that's been expanded is with respect to the boat launch? For this particular uh, property, yes. Okay. So, just again, to clarify for the record, um, uh -huh. it's your statement that the only area of shoreline that has been expanded in this area is with respect to the area on wh where the, the, the boat launch is located, nowhere else. Yeah, I'm fine saying that for this. I, I don't believe that I have, uh, you know, any other evidence other than the boat launch at this point. Okay, so let me just look at, we're just broadening the lens a little bit here, literally. Um, so this is the shorefront here of, of the Whitetail property, correct? Yep. And so it's fair to say it's heavily rip-wrapped already, correct? Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. And so it's really only this area that you're talking about? Yeah, actually, you got your mouse on it exactly. Okay, perfect. Thank you.
just give me one second. I'm just looking at my notes here. And and could you tell me again? I'm looking for precision here. How much was the shoreline at that boat land boat launch area actually expanded in your view? Um, yeah. So if you where exactly where your mouse is, you'll notice that the uh, shore has a kind of a jog in. Um, there's kind of an S bend here. You can kind mm -hmm. of see from where the, the the dry rocks meet the wet rocks that there's a curved line. You're talking um, right here. Right, right there, there's a little pocket mm -hmm. right there, exactly. Mm -hmm. Now, if you go down to the um, exhibit B after photo. Okay, this one here? Uh, uh, nope, uh, down one more, mm -hmm. right here. Yep. That jog is no more. There's now a straight line that goes across where the silt fence has fallen onto the ground. I, exactly, actually. Um, so can I ask a question? Just humor me, because math and spatial relations are not my forte. Okay. okay, but if you have a straight line, as you mm -hmm. have shown that we're looking at right here, correct? As opposed yep. to a jog of a shoreline, mm -hmm. that's a U, mm -hmm. wouldn't that U necessarily be longer? And so, in fact, this actually shortens the, sh the, the shoreline, doesn't expand it? Um, I guess if you're talking about length, uh, but if... For example, let's just say this property owner owned up until the normal high water mark, for example, um, and they decided to fill in some of the lake so that it was straight across. Now they own more land up to the normal high water mark instead of that, uh, you know, small section of area being water. Uh, that's what I would call expansion. They're not making it any longer. Um, it, it, actually, our shorefront definition is pin to pin, so the jogs don't don't really matter. But shorefront, I thought, is defined as the normal high watermark, right? Our shore frontage in our ordinance is from corner pin to corner pin. Right, but we're not, you didn't talk about shore frontage in your notice of right. violation. And you talked about shoreline, expanding the shoreline, correct? Yes. Okay. Let me just get there for a second. Okay, and the definition section, I'm just gonna to go to the definition section in the ordinance. Yep. Shoreline, the normal high water line or upland edge of a wetland. Mm -hmm. And so I guess what I'm trying to ask you is how exactly and by how much the shoreline in that area was expanded? Um, well, I can't give you an exact amount, um, okay. but I can tell you based on the, the photos submitted in the exhibits that um, the S curve is no more uh, and it's now a straight line, which means uh, something had to get filled in. Okay, all right. I'm going to move on here. And I think actually okay. some, of, some of my questions may not be necessary because I think, um, your testimony has clarified that, that you're not talking about the entire shoreline, but rather limited to a certain area. Um, I just want to make sure. Well, that, hold on one sec, Leah. I just want to make sure that we're talking about the same thing here, because um, I'm talking about, when I say that, I'm saying they only filled in or expanded that particular portion. I'm not saying that they, um, you know, didn't do, you know, unpermitted stabilization of that entire um you know, rip rat shorefront. I don't know if that's what you're trying to get. Well, get yeah, to here. I, I, I don't know. I, I'm glad we're clarifying here because to me, there's a difference between expansion of the shoreline and unpermitted stabilization. What I'm making sure yeah, I that's why there there are two separate violations on NOV. Okay. All right. Yeah, and you're talking about uh, NO uh, number eight is what you're talking yeah. about. Okay. All right. Yes. Yeah. All right. Let's move on then. Um, so. We're on to violation number five, which is the creation of a beach, right, without a permit. Yeah. And so I'm going to your exhibits about that creation of the beach. And actually, not creation, it said construction. Reading your language, it says construction of a beach, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. And so looking at exhibit C here, this is the before photo, correct? Yep. And here's the after photo, correct? Yep. All right. Mm -hmm. And 
so you would agree with me that there was a beach already there, correct? Um, well, I wouldn't necessarily say there's a sand beach there. I would say there is the shore front with uh, a lot of large rocks and boulders that have been removed. Um, okay. Uh, and I'm just going to direct your attention to exhibit D of your own materials. Again, this is a before shot. Yep. Um, and I'm looking at that area of what I would call a beach. And I see sand and I even see beach chairs. Do you, do you see those? Yep. And then I see some rocks under the chairs, it looks like. Mm -hmm. And I don't see those rocks anymore. I don't know if those were removed. It looks as though they're gone. Uh, they weren't the dark color that's currently there. Um, and, and, and I, the... I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, please. No, go ahead. Um, and as far as beaches go, um, it's fair to say that beaches are not static, that they change over time, that sand gets deposited or rocks can fall or move. Um, yeah, yeah, you could say that. And is, do you have any evidence at all, aside from supposition, that, that those rocks were not aren't there anymore because of um you know not from natural causes uh i would be surprised um if they were uh removed by natural causes okay so i'm i'm going to just show you some pictures that i i'm going to represent to you that were taken yesterday and i was mm -hmm. out at the property and i took them um and these this is again that same beach area yeah that we're looking at okay and so when I compare those shots taken yesterday, mm -hmm. see how we have a bunch of rocks here? Yeah. And again, rocks here, same kind of rocks that you had shown on your before pictures. Mm -hmm. So it's basically same area, stretch of beach, lawn chairs, people are enjoying it as a beach and the, so where were those in the drone photo? Where were those in the drone photo? I'm sorry. Yeah, I guess I'm wondering why you can't really see those. And actually, if you go to um, the exhibit, the photos that we took on um, October 26th, I'm wondering if we can see those rocks that you see there at the bottom of the stairs in that photo. I'm not sure you can, but I think that's the point uh, you had acknowledged is that beaches change. They're not static. Yeah. I mean, it almost, to me, just looking at these, you know, seeing these new photos, it almost looks as though someone put some sand on top of rocks and that sand maybe washed away over the last year. I mean, that's just what it looks like. Right. So because beaches change, it's a dynamic situation. Yeah. I mean, I, I yeah. So I, I just, I'll go back to your before and after shots for the beach, okay? Sure. And um, how large was that beach before? Um, I would say that's probably about 20 feet. I haven't taken a tape and measured it, um, you so know, you did, in width. You did, did you use your app on your phone to measure it when you were out there? Uh, width, no. And I, I wouldn't bother to mention, uh, to measure how deep it is because it changes throughout the summer. Okay. So you didn't measure it before? No. And I'm not saying that it's spatially, you know, length and width. I'm not saying it's any larger that way. Okay. And I think one of the points that you raised in the notice of violation is that it was constructed without a permit from DEP, and that was problematic, correct? Uh, yeah, yes. And I understand from your testimony today and prior hearings that you've been working fairly closely with DEP regarding alleged violations, correct? Yeah. And are you aware of any um, violation that the DEP is asserting with respect to alleged construction of a beach? Uh, no, I, I'm not sure. I know that DEP issued, uh, you know, a, a notice of violation. Um, okay. I don't have that in front of me, so I don't remember if that was one of the violations or not. If I submitted to you that it was not, would that be surprising? Um, no, because that uh, notice of violation actually came from Alexis at NERPA, and it was Jeff Kalinich, um, you know, in Shoreland Zoning that actually suggested to the town that this was uh, a violation of beach construction. Okay, but um, as far as you know, there's no no violations in that regard from DEP. Yeah, I, I, if you're saying that, then I say sure. Okay. All right, let's go to violation number six. We're making our way through these. Uh, 
Okay. Um, so this is with respect to vegetation removal less than three feet in height, correct? Yeah. And from, I'm just reading from your notice of violation. It says all, categorically, all existing vegetation less than three feet in height um, have been removed within 100 feet of the normal high water line, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's move through various segments of this property. And I'm going to go to exhibit B here. Okay. So this is, I think you said, um, this is taken from the water. And this is the area, I think, is it fair to say that's directly abutting the, the Fernwood property, correct? Yep, yep. And can you point to me exactly where the line, do you know where the line is between um, where the property line is? I don't know. Okay. And do you know how wide, essentially, the Whitetail property shoreline is? Um, not off of memory, no. I mean, I know there's a there's a property pin uh, that we were pointed out. Um, when we did our inspection, I don't know if that is the actual property pin, but I, I was led to believe it is. Okay. And there, there is a survey, and I'm just going to bring it up here so we can all have a look here and talk about where that setback is, 100 feet setback, right? And so your submission is, is that, you know, all vegetation within this 100 feet setback was removed, correct? Um, yeah, and I guess, you know, just in the interest of time, I, I know what you're getting at, and clearly all the vegetation within 100 feet wasn't removed, mm -hmm. um, but to say that there wasn't a good amount of vegetation removed within 100 feet would be, you know, a little ridiculous, at least in my opinion. So I think okay. we can move on to the next one. All right, well, I'm going to ask a few more questions in that regard. So I'm looking at the house here, right? That's where the structure is. That's the house, and yep. this 100-foot setback certainly... Um, goes behind the house, correct? So there's a good area yep. all through that is within the 100 foot setback, correct? Yep. Okay. All right. So let's go back to your exhibits here. And so I'm looking at this is from the water. This is exhibit D. And based on that survey, you'd agree with me that this whole area right here to the right, we're looking at the house from the, the water. That mm -hmm. whole area right there, that's within the 100 foot setback, correct? Yep. And um, that none of that has been removed, correct? Do you agree with me there? Yeah. And this area here, I see all sorts of shrubs and vegetation and lawn and trees. None of that's been removed right there? Correct. Yep. And again, I'm gonna just pull up the pictures taken yesterday. Um, this area that's been left un undisturbed, correct? As far as you are aware? Um, no, I don't think so. So is it your submission that this whole, all of the shrubs could have grown back within that period of time? Yeah, it's possible. I mean, let me just look real quick and see. Um, it's been a while since I've been over to that side. Uh, yeah, I mean, are you, so are you saying, what are you asking? Can you ask that again? I guess I didn't really follow the question. Well, you would, I think in your own, um, violation you'd say that all vegetation within 100 feet and that looks like it's pretty firmly established and has not been removed okay if you're, if you're unsure then i'll just move on to the next area and so this is the area um where you'd alleged that all of the vegetation had been removed and obviously you can see here that that lawn has grown back in but here again is more shrubs trees that is within that 100 foot setback. Would you agree with me there? Uh, yeah, that's pretty close, but. And similarly, this is right behind the house. And I think this is just from another angle, but again, vegetation clearly still intact that was not removed within the 100 foot setback. Correct? Can I, I, can I ask a question to clarify? 
And so are these photos you're pointing to, are these photos you just took today? Yesterday. Yesterday. Okay. So these are photos you took yesterday. I said that was the case. Yes. Okay. I'm just trying to connect it up and understand what you're doing here. Yeah. And, and I'll be clear. I did take these yesterday, but I think it's important to establish, and that's what I'm attempting to do. And I think I heard the code officer agree that none of this area has been disturbed at all. Yeah. Thank, thankfully, yeah. Okay. One, just bear with me one second. So, exhibit B. And I think you had said that sort of all the shrubs and such had been removed from that area, correct? And these these photos are taken in the autumn. I'm, I, I, I'm, yeah. I'm asking you that. They, you we were, yep, these are taken these, in October, yeah. Leaves on the ground, okay. Yeah, so almost this, a year ago. Got it, and so this exhibit D, right, um, again, it shows that these shrubs, uh, granted, you can't see them as well because they're deciduous, but there's still shrubs here those have not been removed. Their leaves are removed, so they're not readily evident. But you'd agree with me that those shrubs are still there and intact. In this photo, yeah. Yeah, in that photo they were. Right, but you took that photo, correct? Yep. Okay. And my understanding is, is that one of the concerns about removing vegetation really is because it hastens the erosion and sedimentation of the lake or the resource. Is that fair to say? Sure. Yeah. And my understanding also is that you've been to that property um, several times, correct? Or yeah, three. Yeah. Three times. And so, on any of those three times, were you able to see any visible set uh, siltation or sedimentation in the water? Um, in the water? Uh, I'm not sure. No, I. I wouldn't you have looked? Uh, no, not necessarily. Okay, and that it, it, it protection of the resource is in fact one of the governing principles of shoreland zoning, correct? Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm not saying that we weren't down at the shorefront. What I will tell you is we walked down um, the first day we were there on October 26th uh, down where the jetty was and it's all mud. I mean. But to see, you know, it all floating out in the water, you got to remember it gets pretty rocky down over there. Um, so it had all basically washed up on shore at that point. So you didn't see any sedimentation in the water or siltation in the water, is what I think I heard you say. Uh, I will say, yes, I did because I'm walking in it. Uh, so, yes. Okay. Second, I'm just. Uh... Moving through here. You had mentioned the jetty, right? When we were talking about, you were just mentioning the jetty, correct? Yep. And yeah. My understanding, that jetty is certainly not on Whitetail. I, I, I meant to yep. be specific and direct my questions to you about, did you witness any siltation at Whitetail? Yeah, I mean, we walked out right down that whole stretch. I mean, it carried all the way over to the launch. So your comments are not, you said the jetty, but you're saying you saw siltation along all the way to the boat launch is what you said? Is that fair? Yeah, let me see if I can find an exhibit to better describe to you what I'm talking about. Yeah, so the after photo on exhibit D, you can see the jetty far off in the distance. We walked down along that entire shorefront from the jetty actually to the boat launch, uh, where you can see the silt fence has fallen down where the large rocks are. Um, that was all mud, like walking on a mud flat. Um, and it was a mix of all sorts of different things, um, you know, compiled in that one spot. All right, moving on to violation seven. Again, this is essentially the same 
removal of vegetation in less than three feet in height, but without a permit, right? So it's the same underlying conduct as violation number six, but focused simply on the absence of a, of a permit, correct? Yeah. And I'll ask you the same questions I did before, that you obviously understood the obligation to testify truthfully, correct? Yes, I think it's very important for people to understand you can remove vegetation less than three feet in height within 100 feet from the water with a permit. And so bottom line is, if I asked you the same questions about this violation um, based on this activity, your answers would be the same. Yes. I don't, I don't need to duplicate. Okay. All right, let's go to um, violation number eight. And this is about stabilization without a permit, correct? Yeah. And would you agree that if shoreland Excuse stabilization- me. I have a question. You, don't, you haven't actually filed an appeal regarding violation eight, have you? I know that violation eight is certainly in our notice of violation, talks about the need to consolidate. Um, and so, and I will say also that if past is prologue, and it should be, that all of these arguments certainly have been, uh, you know, made, and that I think there's a recognition that the notice of violation is essentially, in essence, like a notice pleading, like a complaint. And so, yes, there has been reference to violation. No, I'm talking about your appeal. I'm talking about your appeal. Yeah, I am too. You, you said notice of violation. I'm sorry, notice of appeal, I should say, or my the administrative appeal. I guess I don't understand what the appeal is for violation eight because it isn't there. Well, perhaps hopefully the questions I ask will make that more clear as will my arguments at the end. I guess, so, Mr. Chairman, to the extent there is a, a, an appeal as a violation, I ask that it be dismissed. The ordinance requires that a notice of appeal state the basis on which the appeal is and why it should be granted. There is no explanation as to why violation eight should be, um, should be vacated. To the extent she, there, is a, there is an appeal related to violation eight, it should be dismissed for a failure to comply with the ordinance. Mr. Chairman. Yeah, want to just offer some insight here for us? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you, Mr. Chairman. Are you asking for Attorney Wagner to weigh in on that? Uh, yeah, if I didn't say that, yes, Attorney uh, Wagner. I just didn't hear you properly. Sure. Well, I, I, I think just Attorney Rachin, did you have a response to that argument? Sure. Yes. I mean, in the administrative appeal, we talked about the, ne the need to consolidate various provisions. And throughout these proceedings, I've made it very clear that one of the reasons for that is that had, and, and this argument I know has been made on several occasions, that had they secured um, a stabilization permit as required, you know, as, or as stated as, that they should have done in um, violation number eight, had they done so, that would have subsumed so many of the um, alleged violations with respect to earth moving and tree cutting and vegetation removal. And so, yes, we, we definitely have mentioned, um, we, we certainly have taken exception to this violation throughout these proceedings, because it's verbatim to what has happened in Fernwood. The board has addressed that in prior proceedings, and I don't understand why it would be any different here. I'd like you to point to your notice, your notice, your your application for an appeal where violation eight is appealed. I don't see it. I'm gonna bring that up. Just bear with me if I can. One second, if you just bear with me. Talking about um, on page four, 
of the February 28, 2022 administrative appeal that was submitted. And I'm sorry, I don't have it um, bookmarked here. But talking about how violations number eight and nine cite the exact same provision of this, uh, the, the, S, you know, the, the Shoreland Zoning Ordinance, their fashion is two separate violations. And so that's just been consistent with the submissions from the outset. And it has, in fact, been identified as a basis for, for appeal. So I just want to understand. So on page and I think if it, let me just finish that thought, Eric. I'm sorry. Um, and I'm having deja vu here, frankly, because I think you raised the same exact um, objection in an earlier proceeding, same, same objection. And the board did not sustain it, and they moved forward to make the analysis on this issue. So, so you, know, you, you can turn that right around to you. Every, all the violations alleged against your client were all upheld. So why are we doing this? I mean, that, that, is, that's, that is a circular argument that doesn't work. I'm entitled to raise the argument here. It's different. You pointed out this is a different site. This is a different appeal. So I raised it again. <clears throat> So uh, thank you, thank you both. Uh, so to the board, the the objection that's been raised is that uh, the uh, appeal concerning notice of violation eight uh, it did not contain reasons challenging violation eight, and so uh, the appeal should be dismissed as to violation eight. Uh, so as before, um, you know, I do agree with the attorney Wyckoff that it's a uh, you're not necessarily bound by your prior decision, but I do believe that attorney Ration is correct that uh, in the past you analyzed this and I advised you to uh, look at the notice violation. And uh, if you felt it gave you sufficient notice uh, that that violation would be raised on appeal uh, to uh, allow uh, the appellant to uh, challenge that violation. Um, so I would, uh, my recommendation to you is to compare the notice of violation uh, with uh, the notice of appeal uh, and see if, in your opinion, uh, the town had sufficient notice that violation eight would be challenged. Let me be, let me be clear. The, the appeal set alleges that a procedural issue with regard to eight and nine, that they are the same violation because they're factually the same. It also contains a substantive challenge to violation nine there isn't one as to violation eight so my point is what i heard was a beginning of a, of a of an appeal as to violation number eight on a substantive basis and i'm saying that that appeal we don't have notice of that so attorney Rachel, can you answer why Violation number eight wasn't significantly addressed outside of what was listed on page four. When you say page four, page four of the uh, the appeal, the administrative Correct. appeal. Yeah, we're under the procedural flaws. Sure. I, I think because the reasons I've stated that the so much of what we are arguing is that there is duplication. Um, that this unpermitted shoreline stabilization is just part and parcel. If you look at nine, right, which I think um, Attorney Wyckoff conceded that there was a substantive um, objection to, it's exactly the same provision. If you look, look, look at the notice of violation, it cites the same exact provision. And so one's unpermitted shoreline stabilization, they're both, it's both the same thing. And by saying it's duplicative, excuse me, duplicative, those arguments will apply similarly. And, and I will note that in prior proceedings, as I said, Attorney Wyckoff raised the same issue, that it should be dismissed, and this board decided that it should not, and you should consider it on its merits. That's not to say that ultimately, if you decide on the merits that you disagree, and I would ask you not to, but not to dismiss it in turn uh, before even considering it on the merits. You've already done that in the prior proceedings. And I'd ask that you do the same here, based on the same reasoning. Is the uh, issue clear to the board? Yeah, David, can I chime in? Yeah, please. Um, 
would it appease you is if you just argued nine? I mean, I just it seems like your your intention. I don't want to get ahead of you. It might be as you did with one and two and six and seven to kind of make your arguments for the first one and then ask if your arguments are still stand for the the, the, du the one that you're calling it. You're saying is a duplicate. Would it would it appease everyone if you just made that did that opposite and just made the argument for nine and then said, Alex, do all of these? Um, I, I don't it just maybe a way to. Um, I don't know. It was just my thought. Well, from a procedural standpoint, I just want to be clear. I'm not making arguments right now. I'm simply asking a witness questions. Yeah, I'm not a lawyer. You, I think you understand what I was saying. So let, if I can uh, chime in, perhaps let's help the board. You know, I, I, I do agree that there are, there's a difference. You, you can make a argument that there's a difference between a, uh, uh, whether violation eight is being substantively challenged, that's and there's no evidence to support the claim uh, uh, of that violation, and uh, that violation eight is merely a duplication of violation nine. Um, and I think you can draw, you know, the the notice violation draws the distinction between those two violations. Um, you know, but as as before, I think I advised the board. You know, in in my opinion, that. That distinction is is so nuanced, and it, I don't think it would be appropriate to apply that apply that level of uh, uh, scrutiny. On uh, you know, I agree with Attorney Rachin's position. This is something analogous to a a pleading, and the standard there is is low. Um, so, uh, if you didn't ask for my opinion, but if you were to ask for my opinion, um, I would agree that there's sufficient notice here uh, to challenge uh, eight on its own. And so I would recommend that you uh, overrule uh, the objection from the town. Great, Tom, Fred, Pete. Do, do we need to make a motion on this? I would suggest that you should, yes. I'll, I'll propose a motion that we, um, <clears throat> I, I guess, accept Attorney Rachin's argument and oh move well, i if i can i suggest why don't you make them and you can make this motion and that doesn't mean that you're going to vote for it but uh make a motion to uh um uh, grant uh, or yeah, sustain the town's objection and exclude uh witness questions pertaining to violation eight uh so then if you were to vote against that um, you would be allowing attorney Rachin to continue with the questions. So moved. I'll second that. Any further discussion? Uh, all those in favor? Uh, you guys start. It's got to be a roll call. All those in favor? All those opposed, David, yes. Greg opposed. All those abstaining? I'm gonna abstain. Fred P. Opposed. opposed. Fred? Gotta come off mute, Fred. I agree with you, Dave, yes. So we got one, two, three, four opposed, one of same. Uh, so then the objection is um, overruled, and uh, Attorney Ranch can continue with her line of questioning pertaining okay. to violation eight. Thank you. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. So we're at violation number eight. And um, so, Alex, would you agree that if a shoreline stabilization um, if it was warranted in, in certain circumstances, that this is actually the sort of thing that you can obtain a permit for um, under the Shoreland Zoning Ordinance. And I'm specifically looking at Section 15C12 here, that it contemplates that it is the kind of thing that you so can is, apply. Is, is it an allowed use or is it an allowed activity? Is that what you're saying? It, it, with a permit, yes. Yes. Okay. And the argument, of course, is that the town did not obtain a permit. That's your argument for why this is a violation, correct? Uh, that your client didn't obtain a permit, yeah. And that, um, would you agree that this was part of the permit by rule that we were looking at? Um, let me pull that up for you. Yeah. 
that this permit by rule was seeking the very kinds of shoreline stabilization, erosion control, filter fabric, rip, excuse me, riprap, bark mulch per DEP requirement. So that's the kind of stabilization that is contemplated here, correct? This activity does also require a permit by rule, yeah. Okay, and it's it's essentially very similar, if not the same activity that just requires permits for, from both entities. Within 75 feet, you have to get a permit by rule, yeah. Okay. Um, and did you measure to determine whether more than 100 feet of shoreline that was covered by the um, the PBR, I think here is 98, excuse me, 98 feet of shoreline um, was more impacted as far as you're concerned than what was applied for already? Uh, yes. Can you elaborate on that? I cannot, no. You're okay. looking for the exact number. I don't have that exact number with me right now. I could find it, but it's gonna take time. Okay. All right, um, I'm happy to move on. I wanted to ask you about nonconformities. So we can put our attention here on section 12. Um, you'll agree with me that this is section 12 of the shoreline zoning ordinance that, that deals with nonconformities, correct? Yeah. And in essence, if we look at subsection B2, which is entitled repair and maintenance, talks about how um, the ordinance allows without a permit, normal upkeep and maintenance of non-conforming uses and structures. You agree with me there? Yeah. It says? Okay, and so what I'm wondering is, are, are you looking at, you know, we, we talked about, we saw the pictures that this is a heavily rip-wrapped property. Um, mm -hmm. Do you consider the rip-wrapped area to be a use or a structure? Um, it would be a use, I guess you could say. Okay, and so um, non-conforming uses and structures allow for repair and maintenance, correct? Under the terms yep. of 12 feet? As long as they don't exceed 50%. 50%, uh, I'm, I'm looking for 50% of what? I, I'm not sure what you're talking about. Could you direct me to a provision that says that? Yeah. Um... Um, you're going to want to go to number four under that section. Um, any non-conforming structure which is located less than required setback from the normal high water line of a water body tributary stream or a plantage of a wetland, which is removed or damaged or destroyed regardless of the cause by more than 50% of the fair market of value of the structure before such damage or structure removal may be reconstructed or replaced, provided that, and it goes on and on and on. Uh, but 50% is typically um, when someone is uh, repairing or maintaining a non-conforming structure, um, such as a uh, deck that's just a few feet from the water that doesn't show up on a subdivision plan from 2007. Yeah. Um, if they were to replace that or reconstruct that by more than 50%, they would have to relocate it to 100 feet. Understood. So a couple, couple of follow-up questions then. You had said that this was a non-conforming use. This provision that you just directed us to is a non-conforming deals with non-conforming structures, correct? Yeah, and typically they are the uh, a, a wall for um, you know erosion control is typically treated as a structure. However, it's a structure that's not required to meet the hundred foot setback in most situations, um, unless you know it's not necessarily required for erosion control. All right, so I just want to be clear. Are you saying that it's both a use and a structure? It's just a use or just a structure? I would say it could be both. Okay. And when you say by 50% of the market value, how, how did yeah. you determine that this exceeded 50% of the market value? Well, that would mean we have to assess a market value for the entire riprap wall that was there. Um, and the easiest way in my mind to do that is to just do it based on, um, you know, percentage of the wall replaced. Um, you know, they clearly exceeded 50% of that. Um, How is that clear? That's, that's what I'm trying to understand. Uh, you, you say you're supposing it's clear. How is it clear? Yeah, I mean, I guess we'd have to go back to what did your client pay for this portion of the wall to be repaired? But, you know? well, I think, let's be clear that this is- Well, I mean, if we're going to- we're going to make that conversation or we're going to have that conversation then we're going to probably need some more information i think to clearly come to that 
But I think um, it's what's critical to understand here is that this is your notice of violation, and the no the violations that are alleged must be substantiated mm -hmm. before. I mean, we're not talking about after the fact. It's not our job at this point to submit additional information. This was your allegation. And so I'm simply trying to understand how it is that you came up with those calculations. Right, Leah, but it's your appeal and that burden is on you. And you're saying, uh, you're asking questions trying to prove that they are not in violation for something that's uh, as easy as not having a permit. No, so I, I, I don't. I just don't see where we're going here. Sure, and and I don't want to engage in a back and forth. And I and I think you know the questions. Have I mean, to I'm be fine asked. answering the questions, but I need to I need to understand where we're headed with this in order to give you the accurate information. Sure. So let's back up. You had said that this reconstruct. I had submitted to you that section um, 15C of, excuse me, section 12 with respect to nonconformity nonconformity specifically states that you can repair and maintain. And then you directed me to this reconstruction replacement, and that was the basis yeah. for your thought. Right. So to answer basic. your, to well, answer let me, your excuse question. Excuse me, Alex. I, I haven't finished. If you just let me. I, I know, but I understand you're explaining it for me, for my benefit, and I get it. So let's not waste anyone's time. I do not believe this is repair and maintenance. This is not repair and maintenance. They re, they completely replace this entire existing riprap wall. If someone could explain to me why they felt like they needed to replace an existing secured wall. Then we can talk about that, but there's no reason that I can see. Okay, so, so it was, so I heard you say it was an existing an existing wall, correct? Yeah, but okay. was it legally existing? No one suggested that it isn't. Are you suggesting that now? I'm not saying I don't I don't know if it was legally existing or not, is what I'm getting at. Right, but there's been no allegation whatsoever that it was not legally existing. You have no. not made that suggestion. Okay. We have, no, we haven't formally said that, no, but we're giving that your client the benefit here and assuming that it is. Okay, let me be clear. The notice of violation, going back to my earlier conversations with you, the notice of violation, the purpose of which is to identify any alleged violations, right? Yes. First principle, at any time has it been suggested that this was not a legally conforming use or structure? H has it been suggested? In your notice no, of violation. No. Okay. We have not so raised think, that, no. Okay, so let's let's end that line of questioning then, because you have not raised that. Um, but under violation number eight, right, it talks about over or below the, the normal high water line. So we're really talking about what's below, correct? Yes. Okay. And what you're talking about, I think, is is over and above the normal high water line, correct? We're still talking about eight and nine, right? Yes, we are. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that, that comes from that particular section in the ordinance. Um, and I've never understood why that's where the state dropped it in, but that's where the state dropped it in. Uh, specifically 12, the technical uh, standard that we're relying on is under the heading, uh, you know, for structures or uses extending over or below. Uh, and I think the whole point of that is because sometimes, you know, a riprap wall is actually below the normal high water mark for a majority of the year, um, usually until September. Okay. Um, all right. I think I want to move on to number nine. All right. And this is, again, same provision, un unpermitted storyline stabilization, no barge. Right. Um, yep. And I think you agreed that shoreline stabilization, if it's warranted, that that is the sort of thing you can get a permit for if you get a, if you apply. Yeah. And um, what was the level of the water when this work was done? Are you aware of that? Can you speak to it? Um, it was pretty low. Uh, you can, I, I'm actually pretty sure you could find out the exact level if you wanted to on the website, but um, it's oh, the low what, time of year. What website are you referring to? Like um, I don't know exactly Lake or is it a Sebago yeah, Lake? Uh, the dam, the, the dam has a website where you can go back uh, historically okay. to find the exact. So at that, height. that point in time, it was fairly low, correct? Typically, September, October, it starts to come back up depending on the rain. Okay, and and do you know how much, just in terms of um, draw, in terms of depth, how how much it um, draws when fully loaded with this kind of heavy equipment? Uh, no, no, I don't. Okay. And do you know where the barge would have been situated offshore? 
uh, you know? No. Okay. And do you know what the reach of the excavator is as far no. as? Okay. And what did you do to determine if that barge would have been feasible? Um, just based on uh, seeing it in that particular area, um, that same segment of uh, shorefront uh, on Sebago Lake. Okay. You know, he has the barge, he uses the barge. Um, it's in that, you know, line of work frequently. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, I'm going to move on to violation 10. And this is removal in excess of what's allowed by the point system, right? Mm -hmm. um, and how many trees roughly do you think that was uh, removed at White Tail? Um, I would. Off the top of my head, I'm going to say I would go to the NOV and see what is listed there because okay. um, I don't have that number memorized, unfortunately. All right, that, that's fine. We can we can move past that. Um, mm -hmm. But you'd agree, and I think we've had this conversation before, that you can cut hazard trees without a permit if if the person consults with you prior to doing so. So no no no. Correct. Okay. And you recall, I think oh, I should ask you, do you recall the evidence that was submitted by Aaron Gosselin of Q Team um, that most of those trees were, in fact, in his opinion? hazard trees? I think that was specific to Fernwood. Um, I think it included whitetail as well. But oh. do, do you dispute that that is the case? I mean, I can... Um, well, I mean, we were told um, by Q-Team um, that they didn't do any of the work on 28 whitetail. So I would kind of be a little confused as to why they were assessing hazard trees on 28 whitetail if they didn't do any of the work. Well, let's, I, I'm not sure that's the case. So let's just make sure um, we are clear. Because if you'll recall, Mr. Gosselin submitted evidence in the last hearing. Um, and I have this, I've called this up here. If you just bear with me one moment. Well, I, I, it was my understanding that there were, it, it was both properties, but let's leave that aside for a moment and look at um, the photos, if you give me one sec. So I am calling these photos to your attention. And again, these were taken yesterday. And this is the tree that was removed. This is at Whitetail, and that this is right next to that the deck. Remember that deck area? Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, the stairs. Not the the big deck out front, but the stairs. Do you recall yep. that one? Sorry, and, can I interrupt you just briefly? Are you screen sharing right now? Oh, I'm sorry. I don't think I am. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Can you see? Yes. Okay. Um, yep. Great. So here we have um, one of the larger trees at Whitetail. And from my perspective, I'm looking at a fairly large tree with the middle portion, a large extent of that rotted out. Do you agree with me that that's a fair characterization? Sure, yeah. And would you agree with me that looking at this tree, that that would be the kind of tree that is characterized as a hazard tree? Yeah, could probably meet that definition. Probably or, or yes. Yeah. I mean, who knows what how long that's been there. That could have been there 10, 15 years. I don't know. I think, is that not one of the trees that you identified in your NOV as having been removed? I have no clue. I mean, I, and I'm just not, I'm not trying to be difficult. I'm just saying I can't really tell based on where this photo is taken, if it is one of the trees or not. All right. But you, you, you say that you agree that that is in fact a hazard tree. Yeah, that would look like a hazard. Okay. And you also agree that Aaron Gosselin is a licensed arborist, correct? Yes. And you are not? Correct. Okay. Um, one of the things that is alleged in violation number 10 is the fact that there was some canopy loss. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me how you measured that canopy loss? Yeah, we based it on um, aerial imagery. Okay. So 
from that aerial imagery, what did you use to measure that 20, 250 feet? Uh, that was Google Earth measurement from aerial photo. And just for the layperson to understand, how does that actually work? Um, I believe if you go to the last exhibit in the NOV, um, you know, it, it shows the uh, dimensions that were measured based on the measure tool in Google Earth um, on that actual aerial photo. Are you talking about Exhibit F? That yeah. I'm, um, you can see my screen here. Is that what you're yeah. talking about? Yeah, for some reason, the markup's not showing on that exhibit. Okay, hold on. I think I have another way to get to it. No. But these lines you're saying have been drawn from um, Google Earth. Mm -hmm. that's, that's where you got it. Okay. All right. Yeah. And what was the canopy? How, how, what was it before the tree cutting? Are you aware? Um, so in that exhibit, that exhibit F, Mm -hmm. uh, it does show the canopy before the trees were removed. I, I circled the trees that were removed um, yeah. and, uh, you know, provide a, a dimension for reference um, showing that this that is, number of 250 has been exceeded. Just so I'm clear, this exhibit F here, that's a before photo, correct? Yeah. Okay. So where's the after? Um, the after is not included in the NOV. It actually came out from Google uh, not too long ago. It was probably the last three months that it actually was released. Okay, so when you, at the time you drafted that, you did not have any after photos, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, so moving on to violation number 11. This is vegetation removal in excess of what was allowed by the point system. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just, again, just going back to the, um, the canopy piece, right? Yeah. So we talked about how there's no after photo, but what, what's the scale of the after photo? How did you get that? Uh, it's based on the area that's opened on that site visit. Um, you know, assessing where that area is now open and, and essentially drawing a circle and the number greatly exceeds 250. So, yeah, I mean, I suppose you could try and say it's probably not exact, but we're talking it's uh, well into the thousands of square feet, not hundreds. And you're basing that on what, though? Like, how, how did you measure that when you say it's in the thousands? How do you actually measure, measure that empirically? Um, by using the, you know, the measure tool on Google Earth uh, and, you know, measuring that shore frontage and looking and seeing what's open on site. Uh, we can easily assess, you know, how much area is open now compared to what would have been open if there was a large tree standing right in that spot. Okay. But that was not, um, that was just through the Google piece. That's, that wasn't through your phone app or anything like that, no. right? No. And no. W with respect to both your phone app and this Google tool that you're talking about, um, mm -hmm. how, how are you aware of the reliability of those tools like how can you verify whether or not those are re reliable or reliable well again i'm i'm not a uh surveyor i'm not a state licensed surveyor um so how reliable is the tape measure i mean it really all comes down to the user um you know i've tested the phone app for example and set 100 foot tape and then measured 100 feet and it's uh not close enough to measure inches but close enough to measure feet I've also done the same with the Google Earth tool. So, you know, we have to use what tools we have available to us, and, and that's what I've done. Okay, so let's go to violation number 11, okay? And this is vegetation and removal of the point, in excess of the point system. Um, can you just very quickly let us know how that point system works? Yeah, so essentially you have, uh, for selective removal or removal of vegetation within 100 feet only, within 100 feet, you have to establish 25 by 50 foot grids, and those grids have to contain 24 points based on the diameter of the tree at four and a half feet off the ground. Um, you have to assess every single tree within that 25 by 50 foot grid, assign it a point, and in the end, you have to have at least 24 points, and you have to maintain five saplings. If you have a 25 by 50 foot grid and you cut all but one tree, you are in violation of the point system because you cannot have 24 points with just one tree. 
Um, so that's very easy for me to determine that's a violation. Okay, and, and did you, when you were determining that it was a violation, did you go out, did you actually plot those grids yourself when you went out to the property? I didn't physically plot them on site. We plotted them, you know, again, through uh, Google measurement um, and looking at, you place that, uh, you know, that 25 by 50 foot grid right at the shorefront. Uh, and there's a place where there was trees and there's now no longer any trees. Um, so it's, it's very easy to see that, um, you know, that, that grid is now empty, has no points. And it was selectively removed. Uh, it wasn't for removal of a hazard tree. So that's your only option at that point. And that, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Alex. No, go ahead. That can easily be avoided by getting a permit. Um, you, you can actually cut trees in excess of the point system uh, if you have a permit for you know an approved activity. Okay. Um, again, I'm looking at Exhibit F. Okay, and this is what was submitted in conjunction with um, Violation 11. Can you tell me where that property line is between, because I know a lot of these trees that you're counting and indicating have been removed um, may very well not be on the whitetail property. So. I, I guess I, I don't see why. Um, you know, I mean, obviously we're looking at the lines on this, our, our tax map overlays. Um, they're usually off a few feet. In this particular case, I can tell you they're actually, um, they're skewed too far to the right. Uh, when we met on site a month or so ago, we were pointed out the property line on the right hand side um, next to the driveway where there's a shed that's actually over the line. Um, and the property line on the right actually is just to the right side of that right um, white bubble or cloud that I drew. Um, so by that, I can tell you this tax map line actually should be shifted well to the left. So where the deck is, is actually going to be where that just, point is. Hold on. One, one sec. I just want to make sure that we're, um, we're, with, with, where you're, let's make sure we're looking at the same thing. Yeah. You're talking about Exhibit F? I want to know what you're talking about. Yeah, I'm looking at Exhibit F, and I'm trying to figure out, I want you to tell me where on that, that exhibit that the property line is located. If I can interject, I think the problem here is what you're showing is, is, is Exhibit F doesn't have the actual lines on it that the the notice of violations has on it. Yeah. And I think that's causing some some confusion. Fair enough. I realize that that somehow has been. Do you do you want, do you want me to just screen share mine? Yeah, that would be great, Alex. I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Why don't I just because uh, I can actually explain it a little bit better here. So hold on one sec. Uh, here we go. I'll stop my share. Go ahead. All right, so you can see the markup now, right? Yep. Okay. Um, so what I was trying to explain here is um, the cloud, I'm actually gonna uh, see if I can just, here we go. Um, the cloud over here, can you see my mouse? Yeah, when you say cloud, you mean just kind of those squiggly, like, this right here, yep. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the property line itself is actually right around there. Um, so this tax map is off, the white line here, um, the white property line you're seeing. This corner right here that I'm circling is actually right over here. And that was pointed out to us on site. So this entire white line on the shorefront actually needs to get moved over over here. So this side corner is actually down on this side. And the 50 foot wide walking path right of way that you see on the subdivision plan is actually right around here. Does that help? Somewhat, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I'm gonna move on to violation 12, okay? And I'm gonna, so I'm gonna share my screen again, if I may. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, and so 12, um, you noted that this was within that 1250 square foot area, correct? Yes. And that's essentially the same area that's alleged in violation 11? Um, yes. And you measured it in the same way that you identified earlier? Yes. And how is that different than tree removal? This was vegetation without a permit. How is that different from the allegation that there was a tree, tree removal in that area? So you're saying how is 12 different from 11? Is that what you're? Well, I'm just, I'm wondering, it says removal of vegetation without a permit within the 1250 square foot area. Um, uh -huh. and before you're talking about a point system and here you're talking mm -hmm. about just general removal of vegetation. Yeah, so the point system uh, is in violation of section 15 um, Q, right? Um, just making sure I have the section 15 Q uh, for the 250. And then you have 15 Q 2 B, I believe. Uh, I just so it's one, one's 2A and one's 2B. But you're, you're basically saying that trees and are you conflating trees with vegetation? Are you saying they're the same thing? It's just not clear from this. Yeah, I guess I'm not necessarily following um, the, the question you're trying to ask. Um, the because question it I'm trying seems to... clear to me. Okay, let me clarify. Mm -hmm. Between the house on allegation 12, between the house yep. and the water, vegetation has been removed from a 1250 square foot area. Yep. In that, Correct. are you are you including just vegetation of less than three feet, or are you talking about trees? Or are you talking about both? Uh, both. And so basically, this is the same allegation or the activity, I should say, that is included within violation 11 and 6. 11 being yes. okay. So we agree on that. Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right, so moving on, we're gonna talk about the corrective action, right? As part of any, as any notice of violation, as we said, uh, corrective, corrective action is specified, correct? Yep, yep. And largely here, what you have asked for, for corrective action is a series of after the fact permitting, correct? Telling, yep. okay. And you're aware that management controls and various other parties have submitted after the fact permitting um, originally back in March, there were, mm -hmm. I'll just bring these up here. Um, ex let's see. We had a series of four different after the fact permit applications submitted by Mr. Morris, correct? You recall that? Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, for whatever reason, the town apparently was dissatisfied with this and that they, my clients retained another expert, Elizabeth Ransom, correct? You recall that? Yes. And that she actually submitted back in early August, additional after the fact permitting plans, restoration plans, correct? Yes. Okay. And the town refused to accept those. Do you recall that? Um, yeah, we're not going to accept it until we feel it's um, adequate. Exactly. And wasn't one of the reasons stated um, in the rejection that the, pl it, it, the application doesn't seek anything that the planning board can review here. Correct. Uh, yep. Correct. But yep. isn't this exactly what you had asked for, that they submit plan, uh, plans to the planning board and to the code enforcement officer after the fact? Well, the, the planning board uh, isn't responsible for reviewing a restoration plan. Um, you know, if it meets a specific... Um, you know, uh, under that table of land uses, if it's required to go to the planning board for approval, then it should, um, you know, but if it's a restoration plan that exceeds the scope of what's something that, you know, could be, for example, it could be approved by a code officer, um, you know, then it wouldn't need to go to the planning board. But wasn't the whole point of um, violation number eight as asserted that they needed a, a, a permit for shoreline stabilization and isn't exactly this this is exactly what is being submitted the plans of the stabilization after the fact as it may yeah. be yeah i think one of the difficult things for um for people to understand is uh the planning board likely would not be able to approve that so what happens then you know your client will spend more time and money going to the planning board to get this thing approved after the fact what if they say no 
What if it doesn't meet the requirements of the ordinance? Um, I, those are a lot of what ifs, Alex, but what is there, I mean, aside from submitting the after fact permit that was directly required under the, yeah. the um, corrective action. Anyway, I, I'll leave it, I'll leave it at that. Um, I think that that's it. And I really appreciate your time. I know it's been a, a yep. long and winding road. I appreciate that. Yeah, Thank no you. problem. Thank yep. you. So just from a procedural standpoint, I want to make, make sure I'm clear. Um, I have asked my questions. I don't have any other witnesses. Of course, um, I reserve the right to cross-examine any, you know, if, if necessary. But, you know, I know other parties have their case to put on, and I won't make any final arguments, of course, until a, a, until after that. But I just want to make sure we're, we're clear on the, the process. Wagner. Yeah, so... Uh, Attorney Reichen, you're asking if you'll have an opportunity to make arguments after the other side has presented their witnesses. Yeah. Um, so, yes, I mean, generally how we've done this in the past would that you'd present your arguments um, now and you, you would have an opportunity to give a uh, rebuttal um, after uh, uh, the town puts on their case. Um, so I, I think you would have that. So, yes, you would have that opportunity after. Okay. Reference. Yeah, yeah. I, I think if I recall, you know, we don't make our final arguments until after everybody has their testimony in. I just want to make sure that that's consistent with your recollection. I I, I think it's it's varied uh, on on each appeal. I mean, I know in, in the last one we had uh, there was a mix of arguments and evidence all all at once. Um, so. <laughs> But I have no problem, and certainly it's up to the chair, but I would recommend, you know, to you, Mr. Chair, I think that's a reasonable approach is to allow uh, each side to present their evidence uh, and then return to both uh, the town and the appellant to then make uh, closing arguments, essentially. So, uh, Attorney Wagner, I can gonna ask uh, if you could outline for us the next step in this, and then I'm going to propose we take a five-minute break. Sure. Uh, so uh, the next would be uh, if the board had any questions uh, for the appellant on this uh, testimony so far uh, or for the CEO. Board have any? I don't at this point. Okay. And Attorney Regin, you have no further witnesses? I do not. Nope. Okay. Any other evidence? Yeah. From a procedural standpoint, uh, it seems to me, you know, that we've been building from one hearing to another, correct? And we've all agreed, uh, certainly for today's proceeding, that uh, what is uh, entered from one hearing will carry over to the next. Um, you're going to make decisions here uh, based on these arguments. And then, uh, theoretically, uh, Big Lake Marine will have opportunity uh, to have its uh, um, uh, violation, notice of violation heard. Um, you know, I, I would suggest and would prefer, in fact, opportunity to participate in this line of questioning uh, and in the uh, discussion of evidence here so that we actually have uh, an opportunity to participate in the process. Otherwise, what we'll end up with, which is part of my arguments from the prior night, uh, is that decisions will be made uh, and then we'll either make the pretend that the bell can be gone wrong uh, and we get a fresh start, which I think we all agree. Uh, certainly in the same evening is probably a, a not an accurate uh, description, um, you know, or I can have an opportunity to participate, uh, make some uh, uh, questions of the uh, the witnesses or uh, arguments on uh, Big Lake's uh, behalf. Uh, and I think, uh, especially since the notice of violations are literally identical, uh, the, uh, the determinations made by the board uh, can be made uh, as to both. I, I agree with you. Uh, I, I I think that you've, as a, a other parties here, and, and I would call it, I'm using parties loosely, but I would say you, you absolutely have an opportunity now if you'd like to ask any uh, questions of, a, of Alex, uh, you can. And I, and I, I, I maintain that you, you've had that opportunity uh, before. Um, so I guess that's why I was confused as to your objections uh, uh, last month. Uh, is I, I've always thought I've, how I've laid out the procedure and how the chair's laid out the procedure is that uh, you, even though you're not a 
party in this appeal would have an opportunity as you do now and I'd, I'd say go right ahead to uh, ask uh, questions of this witness so if you have any now would be the appropriate time you would all agree with that and do we want to take a, a a break I know that the chair just mentioned that before I do that or would you like me to continue on uh, with the uh, I, question I have a question so is the thought then Leah as the appellant has asked Alex to put him on as a witness and then are you skipping the town now and then go into Greg to ask questions of Alex or is it no I I guess I I, I Leah has Alex on the stand now as a witness, so I think it'd be an appropriate time for Greg to ask questions relevant to the answers that uh, Alex has given, uh, and then the town will have an opportunity, and you can certainly call Alex back up, and Greg will be given that opportunity again uh, if you would like to ask questions relevant to the answers that Alex gave in response to your questions. Does that make sense? No, I don't think it does, actually. I mean, it's, that seems to be an inefficient way to go about it. I mean, if I was in, I guess what I would, what I had in my head is the appellant has gone, has asked Alex, you know, the question she's going to ask. I think then I should have the chance to, uh, you know, we, the town could put on its present, you know, it's the presentation it's going to have. I can ask Alex the questions I have. And then Greg, if he, he's in, if he wants to ask questions, then he's, he's, then it would have been had everything Leah had, everything I had. And then he can go again rather than him getting two, two bites at the apple. I have no that just, to that. that. That just seems inefficient to me. Yeah, I, I, I you know, I, I think you're right. Um, and if Greg, you have no objections in that, then why don't we do that? And you'll, uh, so we'll go as uh, Attorney Wyckoff uh, outlined. Okay. Now, I heard someone mention something that a break first. Chairman Merch, did you want to take a break before we did that? I do. So uh, I'm showing eight fourteen. Let's uh, reconvene at uh, eight twenty. Okay.
So I believe it was our understanding that Attorney Wyckoff now would have a chance to present. So Attorney Wyckoff, we would be happy to hear what you have to have before us. Sure. So my plan here is, is first, I want to I'm going to ask Alex to um, give the board an overview of the violations um, at Whitetail Lane. And then after he does that generally, then I propose that um, we go through each each of the violations and and Alex and I will together address each of the um, um, the issues raised by the other side. Bear with me, my computer's telling me it's restarting in four minutes here. Hang on, excuse me. I'm trying to prevent this from my computer from restarting. Bear with me, I'm sorry. Okay, with that, with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Alex, please. All right. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, I'm going to try and do this quickly. Uh, uh, all right. Okay. I'm sorry. Whoops, I actually, can you see that? Yes. Awesome, okay. All right, so as you guys know, um, we uh, were tipped off on this violation from DEP, uh, October 14th, 2021. Um, in an email, she sent us a photo of the activity taking place um, on the adjacent property, initially 18 Fernwood and then uh, eventually, she also sent photos uh, of 28 Whitetail as well. Um, we inspected the site um, October 26th, and um, this is the condition as we found it. Um, it was an overcast day. It wasn't raining when we were down there, but um, I, I believe it had rained earlier that day. Um, I'm going to go through the violations uh, listed on the NOV. Um, and the first one is, uh, for filling an earth moving, um, of, uh, greater than 10 cubic yards, no, uh, erosion control. Um, so here you can see existing shrubs and lawn were completely stripped and regraded, um, on the entire left side of the property. Um, there is a mulch berm kind of where the arrow is here. It's actually not an erosion control mulch. It's more of like an ornamental mulch. Um, erosion control mulch is usually more of a reddish color and is larger. It's stump grindings, water logs, so that it doesn't float away. Um, fill was deposited in spots um, when they created the new riprap shoreline. As I said earlier, this was existing riprap. Um, it clearly was doing the job, so I'm not exactly sure. Um, why it needed to be completely, re, you know, replaced. Um, but, you know, ultimately that activity would have required a permit um, and it would have needed an erosion control plan and erosion control um, on site. Um, so here you can see uh, where Lee and I were discussing earlier, the uh, bottom of the boat ramp um, headed down towards the water. This section uh, actually before kind of jog to the left where the boat ramp was and then back to the right as it went around that little peninsula towards the beach. Uh, the way they filled and graded this boat ramp uh, made it a little bit less steep but longer. Uh, here you can see the erosion control on site, um, you know, uh, like, I don't know, less than two weeks after, maybe about two weeks, um, had fallen. Uh, completely down here in this particular spot. Um, the next one here is um, for the boat launch. And so here you can see the boat launch uh, in these photos uh, was two pallets end to end. And 
it was used to lower uh, you know, a rowboat or kayaks and canoes down to the water so they didn't have to take them down the uh, rock shorefront or the stairs. Uh, it's really the only spot to access the water for something like that. Uh, that was the use uh, for it, um, which we can tell by this photo. Uh, they've got some stacked up at the top. Um, so this was the existing, this is what they replaced it with. Um, you know, it's now uh, shallower, wider, firmer, um, and uh, it was done without a permit from the planning board. Um, okay, um, the next thing here um, is for the shoreline itself. And this photo is a before photo. You can see uh, the site as, as it existed um, from one of the older Portland Water District photos. Uh, the after photo, you can see all of the ground cover um, and trees in that area has been you know, essentially all removed to grade that slope back uh, with a very large riprap wall. Uh, next one we're gonna go to is beach construction. We did talk about this a little bit already, so I don't wanna go into it too heavily detailed, but you can see there's large boulders on the shore at the water in the before photo. Um, the after photo, all of the large boulders are gone. Um, so they have effectively created a, you know, a nice sand beach area, which once they go down and rake it up, um, will be the perfect spot to hang out. Um, those rocks were removed, creating a beach. Um, coincidentally, I mean, it's also possible that they brought sand in um, to cover some rocks. Uh, looking at the photos that Leah presented earlier from the site today, it does look as though um, sand may have washed away and it's now exposed the rocks that were there before. That's also possible, um, you know, on site. Vegetation removal, um, less than three feet in height. You can see there's, uh, in this older Portland Water District photo, there's grass and shrubs um, on a majority of the lot shorefront, and that has been completely removed. Um, the work could have been done um, from a barge. You know, Leah mentioned earlier that this area was disturbed uh, for storage of the excavation equipment necessary, required to replace um, the existing riprap wall. Um, that section exists in the ordinance to prevent that very thing. Uh, the planning board is supposed to make a determination if that work could be done from the barge or not um, to avoid disturbance to the shorefront, the protected area. Um, Rob does own a barge. He um, you know, does do a lot of work on the barge or has done a lot of work on the barge. Um, and, you know, he did mention at a site meeting, um, you know, a couple of months ago that he felt as though he could do repair work from the barge. Um, down there, uh, if necessary. Um, so I, I do think um, you know, this work could have been done from the barge. Ultimately, that was the planning board's decision that they never got to make. Uh, tree removal within 100 feet for activity other than timber harvesting. Multiple trees have been removed. Um, again, back to this old photo, you can see all the trees here, so four small trees, a large one here, another cluster of small trees. Um, and then a couple other larger trees have all been removed. You can see the after photo showing where they were. Uh, again, on this drone photo from Portland Water District, you can see there's other trees that um, were existing that have all been removed. Uh, this is for vegetation removal in excess of specific standards. Um, this first one, is uh, excess of the point system, which I explained earlier, 25 by 50 grid. The diameter at four and a half feet determines how many points the tree is worth. And you have to maintain at least 24 points. If we establish just one grid here um, where you know a couple large trees were removed, these trees are no longer, there's one still standing in that area, um, but a majority has been removed. Uh, they definitely have exceeded the um, the point system allowance here and the 250 square foot um, canopy opening. I believe that is it.
I'm going to pass it off to Eric. Thank you, Alex. And then I'm going to I'm going to share my screen here. Okay. Okay, I just make, want to make sure that you can see what I'm doing here. Do you see me turn, changing a page number? Yes. Okay, good enough. Okay, um, so first, uh, I just want, I'm going to address that management controls makes this overarching um, argument that it relied on its contractor to obtain um, permits and do work consistent with the shoreline zoning ordinance. And, and in the first instance, um, the ZBA should reject that argument just as it, as it did in connection with um, management control similar arguments relating to the Fernwood administrative appeal. As the property owner, uh, management controls was responsible for what happens on its property at its direction. And here the contractor, um, Big Lake Marine Construction or Big Lake Marine um, is management controls agent. Uh, management controls hired Mr. Grant for the project. And um, we know we've seen a copy of the contract with its with the applications for an appeal here and uh, management controls acknowledges it asked mr grant to obtain the permits um and i'm going to just show you for a moment the appeal that was submitted by um durant excavating and then i'm just bear with me i'm going to show you that um and with that appeal they submitted the per uh, Big Lake Marine submitted the permit by rule notification and on it, it identifies the applicant as management control um, and the agent as Big Lake Marine. And my point being that Big Lake Marine was acting as the agent for management control and um, a principal is liable for the violations that are um, that are engaged in by the principal's agent. So management controls is is um, law, is responsible for any violations committed by its agent here, Big Lake Marine. And then I just want to go here. Here's the here's the the invoice where management controls is it sending an invoice? Uh, pardon me, that Big Lake Marine is sending an invoice to management controls for the work that it did. Now um, I also provided the board with a copy of a application that was recently um, submitted to the Department of Environmental Protection by Ransom Environmental on behalf of uh, management controls. And I'm just going to go to the third page of this document. And in, on the third page of the document, Ransom describes what happened here as the, the work um, it's right here that the scope of the work it really is that that these issues relate to the scope of work completed by contractors on behalf of management controls and my, my point is um, that this work was you know ransom on behalf of management controls is acknowledging that the work was done on other con by other contractors on behalf of management controls um, so here a, a property owner and as principal management controls is responsible for the actions of its contractor. And I've given you a, a statutory citation for that concept. Um, and that uh, another section, section 444, providing that any person who orders or conducts an activity in violation of a municipal ordinance is penalized in accordance with the, the, the statute here. Um, and then the Shoreline Zoning Ordinance itself says that permit applications must be signed by an owner or a person authorized by the owner. And I've also given you a, a, a case law citation for a case that stands for the proposition that a principal is liable for the agent's misconduct within the scope of the agent's authority, wh whether or not the principal is aware of the misconduct. So the ZBA should reject uh, management controls contentions that it isn't responsible for any violations here because it hired its contractor to obtain permits and to do work consistent with the Shoreline Zoning Ordinance. It's responsible for those violations as well. Next, I want to go to uh, violation number one. And violation number one relates to filling and earth moving um, that occurs in violation of the Shoreline Zoning Ordinance. 
And the ordinance requires that that activity be done in a way that to prevent erosion and sedimentation of surface waters. And that if a permit is required, that it be done in accordance with an erosion and sedimentation control plan. Um, for all the reasons that you upheld this violation as to management controls for Fernwood, you should uphold it. You should uphold the violation um, with regards to Whitetail as well. And now I'd like to ask Alex if he could just walk us through what this violation is and describe it. Um, yeah, so here um, we have the, um, the activity of the soil disturbance taking place without an erosion control and sedimentation plan. Uh, we require that to be submitted, uh, meet those requirements prior to the activity taking place. And then we also require that erosion control plan to be followed uh, to protect the environment. Okay, let me just go to the, um, let me go to the, Here's a photo, this is exhibit B to the notice of violation. Alex, can you just describe to us what we're seeing here and describe the violation yeah. that's being depicted? Yeah, I mean, there's, uh, you know, at the top of the hill, you'll see there's exposed soils. Um, and at the bottom of the hill, um, you see uh, <laughs> erosion control, a silt fence that's fallen down, uh, was uh, kind of carelessly placed, it looks like, um, at the bottom of that bank, but- um, Is that right here where my cursor yeah. is moving? Yeah. Okay. Okay, let me just go to exhibit E. Okay, could you just, could you describe to us what's occurring here? Yeah, so um, activity taking place in the uh, after photo at the bottom here, um, it clearly shows that uh, there's exposed soils on the bank and at the bottom of the hill, the silt fence is in place where there's, um, stabilization and then where the bank is not stabilized, the erosion control ends, uh, which is not what we want to see. Okay. Can you just, can you describe what's happening in the bottom photo here? Yep. Same thing. Uh, silt fence uh, has, uh, has fallen down and is not doing anything. Okay. I'm going to go to next, the next violation is violation number two. Um, the shoreline zoning ordinance requires a permit from the code enforcement officer for any fill or earth moving of more than 10 cubic yards that occurs in the zone that's at issue here. Um, Alex, can you just can you just describe um, what is what describe this violation, and I'll go to the um, I'll go to the exhibits. Yeah, so 10 cubic yards is one um, good sized dump truck. So uh, if you look at um, any of these exhibit photos and the after photos, um, yeah. you will see that uh, a significant amount of disturbance has taken place, um, but they also brought in mulch. Um, they brought in all of the rock um, and it doesn't take very much to reach that 10 cubic yard threshold, uh, which they exceeded by probably quite a bit. Okay, so let's just, um, let me go to exhibit A here and if you could just walk us through these first three pages and just describe what we're saying related to this violation, please. Yep, so the um, bank has been stripped, graded. Um, the old rock has possibly been removed or covered on top of with uh, new material. Um, okay. Here is the um, area that's been uh, you know, vegetation has been removed. And then this is the new bank um, in place with the new material. Um, just in this one photo alone, right there, I mean, they definitely exceed um, a single dump truck worth of riprap, that's for sure. Okay, let's go to exhibit B here. If you could just kind of, if you could describe this as well. Um, this one is for the boat ramp. Um, yeah, so the boat ramp, um, here you can see that they um, deposited, you know, uh, much more riprap than, uh, you know, was clearly on site. You can tell by the slope of that um, boat ramp is much shallower pitch than what existed before. Um, all that mulch on the side. Okay. 
can you just can you describe what's we're seeing here in relation to this violation of the yeah um the filling and earth moving yep all of this material on in the after photo the riprap the mulch all of that's all new been okay. deposited on site without a permit okay and could you describe um on this page and this page the same thing yeah this is a very large area um it goes back almost about 100 feet from the water we're probably out 50 to 75 feet um just you know the the stripping of all of the grass that was there or if you're running equipment over it constantly and disturbing that site um you're disturbing an area that's um all sloped towards the lake and all of the water from the top of the lot and the road behind it and the roof is all coming down that and headed right for that nice new pitched uh boat ramp okay um I'm going to go on to violation number three, and this violation relates to the um, the boat launch. So, as a permanent structure, construction of the boat launch requires planning board approval. Um, Alex, does the town have any record of any planning board permit relating to the boat launch? No. Okay. Now, the Shoreline Zoning Ordinance also requires that a boat launch have a permit from the DEP. Are you aware of that existing? No. Okay. And now the ordinance provides that a non-conforming structure can be expanded, but only after obtaining a permit from the same permitting authority. Is that right? Correct. Okay. And so here then expansion of the boat launch would require a permit from the planning board, from the planning board, correct? Correct. Yes. And again, the town doesn't have any record of that is that right no okay um i'm gonna have let's go back to uh, exhibit b and just have you just describe this sure okay yeah so uh this boat ramp uh was a wooden structure uh like i said in the presentation it looks as though it was just two wooden pallets um end to end used to uh, transport kayaks, canoes, uh, rowboats up and down the shore since they can't do it uh, from the rock because it's pretty steep already. And okay, the and stairs. You know, I'm just gonna stop for a moment and I'm gonna go to, um, I'm gonna show you for a moment, um, pick the, some pictures that were just submitted today were that were that mm -hmm. um, Leah reforded to the Z ZBA today. Um, these are photos that were included yeah um in there and my understanding is, is and you tell me if i'm wrong that these show what the what the former boat launch looked like yeah okay yeah this okay is definitely it yeah. so then here that's what what's what replaced it yeah i mean it doesn't even look like the same uh same lot <laughs> okay, completely right. different. i mean it, it, it's clearly expanded isn't it Oh yeah, definitely. Okay. I mean, it's much larger. Okay, I'm going to go back to um, what management control also provided to um, the ZBA today. And in here, I don't know if you recognize this, but this is uh, uh, you confirm it if you if to me, Alex. This is part of the application that um, Attorney Rachel described that was submitted to the Planning Board from Mike Morse. Does that look with, like what that's what this is to you? Yeah. Okay, and I just wanted to point out here um, that in that document, here's what he stated. And could you just read that to the ZBA, please? Yeah, the width of the boat launch uh, was expanded to approximately 16 feet, uh, largely as a result of the removal of a large tree stump that altered the site slope grade, the side slope grade. Okay, um, good enough. Okay. Um, let's see. I think that for and also actually um let's see okay i think that pretty much wraps up for violation three let's move on to violation number four um violation four is for enlargement or expansion of the shore of shoreline without a permit um and here the shoreline zoning ordinance provides that where permanent piers docks wharves bridges, boat launches, and other structures and uses extend over or below below the uh, normal high water line approvals required from the planning board. 
and for all of the reasons that the ZBA upheld violation five in the notice of violation of uh, management controls relating to, to Fernwood, you should also uphold this violation. But beyond that, Alex, could I have you describe the, the enlargement or expansion of the shoreline? And I'll, I'll go to um, the, the, the exhibits to the um, notice of violation for that. Yeah, um, here in exhibit B at the, in the before photo at the very end of the arrow for existing boat ramp, um, you can see it uh, curves in um, away from the water at the end of that peninsula. And in the after photo, you can see that it's a straight line across. Um, there's no longer the curve in where the water was coming in. Um, and uh, so it is clear to me that this area has now been expanded towards the water um, to create more of a straight, cleaner angle. And I think there was, you know, I was I was kind of a little confused from the questions that Attorney Rachel was asking you, but I, I think what your testimony is, is that essentially the U is filled in. Is that basically what it is? Correct. And what's that, what has the U been filled in with? Uh, rip wrap. Okay. Okay, let's all, then we'll have you look at exhibit D here. You just describe what we're seeing there. Yeah, so I mean, at the bottom here, you can see, you know, that after photo, likely that shoreline kind of came, continued straight kind of parallel with that um, silt fence. Um, and then, and then turned right once it hit that peninsula, but now it's kind of curving out into like more of a, a straighter line instead of having a jog in. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna to go to viol violation number five. Now violation five is for construction of a, of a beach without a permit. And the shoreline zoning ordinance requires that the construction of any beach shall have a permit from the DEP. Um, and for all of the reasons that you upheld violation six that was contained in the notice violation of management controls relating to 18 Fernwood, you should also uphold this violation as to whitetail. So, Alex, could you just, could you walk us through um, this violation, please? And I'm going to go to Exhibit C. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, what we're seeing here, then the before photo, um, you know, there's some large boulders on the beach, um, rocks that existed, that don't exist in the after photo. Um, my original assumption was that they were removed. I don't know if they were used to make the, uh, you know, the riprap um, stabilization project uh, work or if they were brought into the water or offsite, who knows, or if they were covered with sand. Um, really, the end result is now a cleaner, smoother, flatter um, beach area. Okay, very good. Um, we'll move on to... Um, violations six and seven. Um, so violation six is for clearing or removing vegetation less than three feet in height within 100 feet of the normal high water line. And the shoreline zoning ordinance prohibits, uh, prohibits that from occurring. Now, mm -hmm. violation seven is for clearing or removing vegetation without a permit and in the shoreline zoning ordinance prohibits clearing or moving of vegetation really of any height without a permit. And for the same reasons that you upheld violations seven and eight in the notice of violation relating to Fernwood, you should also pull these violations here as to whitetail. Um, Alex, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to walk us through these, this violation, these two violations here, and I'm gonna go to exhibit um, D for that, bear with me. Yeah, okay. so in the, in the before photo, you can see that um, there's vegetation on the bank, and actually there's uh, grass and, and some ground cover growing in this, um, this retaining wall, which is exactly what you want. Um, and, and then and in the after photo. Yeah, I just want to be clear. And what you're talking about, you're talking about the vegetation growing within this hash, the area that's yes. marked by the hash line? Yes. Okay. Yep. And then... Um, in the after photo below, um, 
that uh, that segment of shoreline was replaced and everything that was there has been covered or removed. Okay. And then let's go to, just describe this to me. Yeah. So um, here you'll see there's, uh, you know, grass, uh, natural ground cover and shrubs, um, which uh, have been completely removed. Um, and I think, you know, it was stated that they were ornamental or landscape, um, you know, features that weren't serving any purpose. The ordinance doesn't differentiate between the two um, within 100 feet vegetation, less than three feet in height, um, or vegetation in general uh, is required to be removed under the uh, removal standards. Okay. Can you, do, can you just describe this here too? Yeah, again, here's that large section that I talked about before next to the house um, that was grass. Um, originally, uh, you know, has been stripped of everything um, down to the water. Okay. And this is just a different angle of that same area. Okay. Yeah, I mean, this one is uh, probably one of the more drastic uh, angles of this particular property. Um, you know, you've got all of that vegetation, uh, the ground cover in there that uh, no longer exists. It's all been removed. Okay. And, and just to orient ourselves here, is this is this the location here of the um, the boat ramp? Correct. Okay. That is it. Can I just have you describe this here too? Yeah, so you can see there's a few different spots where grass has, you know, over the years grown up between um, this existing riprap. Um, and, you know, that's exactly what you want, holding the bank together, um, you know, absorbing rainwater as it comes down. Um, and that's uh, all been removed. Okay, thank you. Now, as Alex pointed out, there's been some contention that this vegetation was of, of limited value. Um, you know, you should reject that argument here because those issues would have been considered by the code enforcement officer if a permit had been applied for here. There was no application for a permit submitted. The code enforcement officer never had the opportunity to consider that. And you should reject that. And here, because this work was completed without a permit, it, it's a violation. Um, and like Alex was just mentioning, whether the vegetation was within an existing lawn or ornamental shrubs, that just isn't relevant. What's relevant is whether vegetation less than three feet in height within 100 feet of the normal high water line was removed and whether vegetation was removed without a permit. Both of those things occurred. Therefore, both, the, both violation six and violation seven have occurred. Now, I just wanna talk about violation, violation eight. Violation eight, um, is for the unpermitted shoreland stabilization project. Um, and there's some discussion about discussion about that. Alex, can you just describe what that, um, what that violation consists of? Yeah, I mean, there was, like we had talked about before, there is an existing um, riprap shorefront here. Uh, the shoreline was all stabilized. There's um, no clear need for an erosion control project based on what we've seen on these photos. Um, they, for some reason, decided that they didn't like the look of it, maybe. Uh, maybe it just wasn't what they wanted. I don't know. But um, nevertheless, they went ahead and uh, removed, covered, replaced what was there with new uh, riprap. Without and any no, permits. no application for permit was made. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Okay, violation number nine is for completing a shorefront stabilization project without a barge. And for the same reasons that the ZBA upheld this violation as to Fernwood, you should also uphold the violation as to Whitetail. Um, now- Mr. Chairman, I just, if I may just register an objection, please. Sure. Um, I've heard I attorney Wyckoff say on several occasions that for the same reasons that you know, you um, you should uphold the violations in Whitetail as you should on Fernwood. As I said in my initial remarks, I think it's really critically important to focus the board on the fact that these are two very different properties for all the reasons I identified. But um, I just wanted to make make clear 
that 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 is um, on the record. I appreciate that. You know, you're right. What I what I'm what I what I'm really trying to say is for all you know for the um, for the facts are different, but for the reasoning that you employed with regards to the other property, that same reasoning should be used here, applying the facts relating to Whitetail. Um, so, as Alex testified earlier, the, struggle, the a stabilization project requires a permit from the planning board, and when that happens, the Shoreline Zoning um, Ordinance directs the planning board to determine if access by a, board, a barge was feasible or not. Now, the contention by management control is that a barge wasn't feasible. You should reject that. You shouldn't, you shouldn't pay any attention to that argument because that issue would have been considered by the planning board had a permit been applied for. There wasn't an application for a permit ever filed, and the planning board never had the opportunity to consider whether a barge was feasible or not, so you should just reject that argument. Um, so I want to have you, Alex, if you could just uh, go to Exhibit E here and just describe what this photo, um, the significance of this photo. Yeah, so this is a picture of Rob's, uh, Rob Durant's uh, Big Lake Marines barge. Um, and excavator moored on Sebago Lake, uh, November 16th, 2021, uh, just around the cove from where this property, um, the work take place or has taken place exists. Um, and uh, so, yeah, he does a lot of work throughout the summer on this barge. We see yeah. it all over the place. And, and Mr. Durant, you've, you've spoken to Mr. Durant about the concept of, of doing restoration work here this fall, is that right? Yeah. And what did he Correct. say about the concept of using a barge to do the work? Well, it was brought up on site when we met, um, I don't know, a couple of months ago at this point. Um, whoops, hold it's on. Sorry. Um, we met on site and it was discussed about um, who would do the restoration work and when that would be done and would it be feasible to do the work um, this fall. And Rob, um, stated that he felt as though he could do the work to the 28 whitetail property from the barge. Okay. Okay. I want to, uh, next one to talk about violations 10, 11, and 12. Now, in the appeal, management controls contends that trees were removed to accommodate construction equipment. Now, you should just reject that argument because that issue would have been considered had management control sought a permit, but as 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 is clear, no no application was submitted, um, so you should just reject that argument. And then there's also a contention that these trees would have been hazard trees and they could have been removed. You should also not credit that argument at all because those issues would have been considered by the code enforcement officer had he been consult consulted as required by the Shoreland Zoning Ordinance relating to hazard trees. Now, violation 10 is for violating the Shoreline Zoning Ordinance's prohibition or moving trees that create an opening in excess of 250 square feet. Uh, violation 11 is for removal of vegetation in excess of what's allowed by the point system contained in the Shoreline Zoning Ordinance. Violation 12 is for violating the prohibition against removal of vegetation without a permit as a result of removing vegetation between the house and the water here. Um, so the Shoaling Ordinance does allow hazard trees to be removed after consultation with the CEO if one canopy opening would be less than 250 square feet. Uh, if the canopy opening is greater than 250 square feet, then replacement with native trees is required and the ordinance requires that stumps may not be removed. So now, Alex, um, was there any consultation with you regarding any hazard trees and removal of any hazard trees? No. Okay, so as a result, we don't know whether or not they were in fact hazard trees, fair to say? Correct. Now, under the ordinance, if someone, if, if someone comes to talk to you about the removal of hazard trees, I understand you could require submission of that evaluation to a forest regarding hazard trees, is that right? Correct, yep. But that never happened, right? Correct. Okay. Um, now, an opening in excess of 250 square feet can be created. And if that happens, then um, yeah, there has to be revegetation. Re and revegetation can only occur pursuant to an approved revegetation plan. 
was that submitted in connection with the removal of the trees? No. Okay. Um, I'm going to have you walk us through the violation. I'm going to go to exhibit F. Mm -hmm. Can you just describe this, please? Yeah, so here we're seeing in the before photo, um, you know, 11 trees that were removed for the um, erosion control project illegally without a permit. Okay. Um, that's a perfect example of uh, something that would get reviewed um, under the permitting process for an erosion control project, stabilization project. Okay. Just here we're looking at. Go ahead. Yep. 10 through 14 in the before photo, and then the approximate location of those trees on the uh, new segment of shoreline. Uh, or rather the, la the, the non-existence of the trees and them being removed. Correct. Okay. This photo? And we're looking at, uh, yep, 11, um, 12, and 13. Okay. Which I, I don't see how... I mean, 12 and 13 were likely removed for the replacement of the wall, I would assume. They clearly wouldn't have been hazards. I can't see how they would have been, but. In any event, they were they were removed. Correct. And that, that was in violation of the ordinances. Correct. Okay. Can you describe this picture, please? Yep. And here we're looking in the before photo of uh, tree 14 as we identify them and the after that tree has been removed. And you, were, you weren't consulted about what that tree was like, and so you don't know what it, what kind of tree, what it was like. Correct, yeah. Okay. Can you describe this page, please? Yep. And again, before, we're looking at trees 1 through 10, and then the after photo, uh, the approximate locations of trees 1 through 10 uh, during construction of the project. Okay. Now... How do you know, so describe this, um, this page, please, this last page of Exhibit F. Mm -hmm. Can you describe it, Alex, please? Yep. Um, so here we're looking at the aerial photo um, from, I believe this was 2018, uh, Google Earth. And this is showing the areas where trees have been removed. Um, and it's uh, included, I've uh, added some dimensions to give you an idea. Um, 25 by 60 is in excess of uh, 250 square feet by a good amount. And then you add in um, the other two sections and uh, you exceed the uh, standards for what's allowed to be removed. Okay. And, and, and all those trees that made up those bubbles are trees that have been removed. That is that right? Correct. And... That was depicted in the photos we just looked at, that those, the, those trees that were removed. Correct. Now, earlier we heard um, Attorney Rachel was asking some questions relating to the notice of violation and what it stated um, could be done in order to eliminate the violations. And I just want to have you go to that page and, and, and read that to um, the Zoning Board of Appeals. She was trying to make it sound like the town was asking only for submission of after the fact permits. And I just wanted to have you um, relate to the board what the notice of violation actually said as to how they could be remedied. And you could just, first is for violations one and two, could you just describe what the notice of violation says? Um, yeah, for uh, violation one and two, well, the above it asks for a global restoration plan, which um, should include the following. And then for one and two, um, they needed to obtain after the fact permitting for filling and earth moving that occurred of more than 10 cubic yards. And if you cannot obtain a permit, restore the area to its condition before the filling and earth moving. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's it for that one. And, and, and really, that's the case for all of these violations, that the town mm -hmm. asked for either to obtain an after-the-fact permit or, if that wasn't possible, to restore the site to its original condition. True? Right. Now... I think you said it, we, we, Mike Morse did submit an after the fact application to the planning board. Is that right? 
Correct. Do you have an understanding as to who actually hired him? Was he hired by management controls? Uh, I believe he was actually hired by uh, Rob Durant. Okay. And did you review the restoration plan that he submitted? Yes. Okay. How did you evaluate it? Um, we found uh, quite a few deficiencies, things that we were um, just a little disappointed by. Okay. Now, do you have an understanding about what the status of that application is? Um, I believe it was submitted and then tabled. And uh, I believe at that point, Mike had, Mike Morse had um, contacted Sandy to let her know that this likely would need to stay tabled for a while. Okay. So you're, it's your understanding that he basically said this to Sandy Fredericks, this should just be tabled in, until until we let you know otherwise. Yes, I believe so. Okay. Okay, I, I just want to address some procedural um, arguments that have been made by management controls. Um, they contend that it contends that violations one and two are the same violation and that they're only listed twice in order for the town to seek duplicative fines. And for the same reasoning that the ZBA used with regards to a similar argument relating to violations one and two as to Fernwood, the ZABA should also reject that argument. These are two separate violations. Violation one is for filling and earth moving without taking steps to prevent erosion and sedimentation. Violation two is for filling and earth moving without a permit. Even if a permit existed for filling and earth moving, there would still have been a violation for the failure to take steps to prevent erosion and sedimentation. And even if steps were taken to prevent erosion and sedimentation, but the work is done without a permit, it would still be a violation. Now, to the extent that management controls is making any argument relating to fines, you know, you should you should reject that. Fines, that's a separate issue from violations. And the ZBA doesn't have any jurisdiction, doesn't have any role with regards to assessing fines. So that's really beside the point and, and it isn't something that the, the, planet, the, the ZBA should be considering here in connection with the appeal. Management controls also contends that violations six and seven are the same violation. And they're only listed twice in order for the town to seek duplicative fines. So, just like I said, fines, that's not for the ZBA, doesn't have a role in connection with assessing fines. So that's just an argument that you, you should disregard. Um, you should also disregard this for all the same reasoning you employed in the other appeal as to Fernwood. These are separate violations. Violation six relates to violating a requirement that vegetation less than three feet cannot be cut, covered, or removed, um, except for a footpath. Violation seven, is for, is for moving vegetation without a permit. Um, you know, if there had been a permit, removing the vegetation less than three feet tall within 100 feet of the, the normal high water line would still generate a violation. So these are, these are just separate violations and you should reject this argument. Management controls also makes an, a procedural argument relating to violations three and four. Um, and they contend that these both cite the identical provision of the Zoning, zoning ordinance and but are included as two separate violations and it's only being done in order to seek to tip duplicative fines. Same story there. That's not for you to deal with. Fines aren't something the Zoning Board of Appeals um, deals with. These are separate violations. Three is for expanding or enlarging the boat launch without a permit. Four is for expanding or enlarging the shoreline without a permit. There are separate violations and they don't rely on one another and you should just, you should reject that argument. Management controls also contends that 10, 11, and 12 are the same violations um, because all, they all involve unpermitted tree removal and are just redundant for seeking duplicative fines. Same, same thing there. Fines aren't for the Zoning Board of Appeals to deal with. That's, that's not your issue to deal with. You should also reject this argument for all the same reasoning you employed in the other appeal as to Fernwood. These are separate violations. Violation 10 uh, is based on the Shoreline Zoning Ordinance, which prohibits removal of trees within 100 feet of the water that creates an illegal opening in excess of 250 square feet. Violation 11 is a separate provision in the, in the ordinance. It allows selective cutting of trees within a buffer strip 
as long as you've got, you maintain a stand of trees and other vegetation. And if other trees are present, that provides sufficient points to allow for selective cutting. 12 is removing vegetation without a permit and it relies on a second, a, a separate provision in the, in the ordinance. So these are separate violations relying on separate provisions in the ordinance and they don't rely on one another. I don't have anything else. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so Attorney Wagner, if I understand correctly, at this point, the zoning board can ask questions of Alex and uh, great. So I do have a couple of questions, uh, Alex. Uh, just to clarify, uh, again, will I have opportunity to question the witness and participate in the uh, proceeding? Yes, after the yep. board has had an opportunity to have questions and Attorney Rachel, then we'll turn it over to you and any members of the public. So Alex, uh, for the notice of violation, uh, specifically number three, what we're talking about, um, boat launch, there was a picture shown. Um, I think it's under exhibit B and it shows the stairway and then it shows the older, the picture of the older boat launch. And then there was a reference given in that picture of the width of the older boat launch. Is it possible to bring that picture up again and essentially point out where- Let me, let me I can share my screen. Yeah. I think, is this the photo you're talking about? Yeah. Especially the one on the the before on the bottom, um, just I can see clearly. I, I can see the steps. Can essentially with a, a pointer show sort of like the width, <laughs> you know, the side to side of the boat launch from that from that view. Is that an option? Oops, sorry. It's kind of coming blurry. So is there any chance with a pointer to just say, you know, point out from left to right, this is where we where you perceive the, the width of the the pre-existing boat launch. So I think you're asking Alex to do that, and I'm trying to figure out how to do that logistically so this is on my screen. Oh, he's doing it. You're muted, Alex. I love Zoom. Zoom, Zoom is great. Um, sorry. Uh, once you're in that particular menu, you like you can't mute or unmute yourself. So, all right. Um, yes. So from here, uh, it's black too. So hold on. Um, I'll do it white. From here to here. From here to here. Can you see that one? I can see them. Yeah, I can I can even see the black one too. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much yeah. for that. Yeah, no problem. Uh for number four, we're talking about the shoreline. Uh I, the references to section 14, table of man uses number 17B, permanent piers, dock, structures, wharfs, bridges, boat launches, and other structures. Um, is the contention or the argument that shoreline is a structure? Yes. Okay. Do we have? It also says uses. So when we wrote this up, where what is it? Are we defining shoreline as a structure or a use? Um, hold on uh, one second. I'm, I'm trying to find something that, that will help answer this question.
Um, if you want, I, I think Leah jumped in. If you want to maybe let her speak and then I can circle back to. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt the question. I just wanted to clarify um, that, you know, under this section, we're talking about piers, wharves, docks, those kinds of things that um, if you look at the definition of structure, it talks about, and I don't have it in front of me, but housing people and, and you know, a, a shoreline does not fall within those things that are traditionally associated with structure. I know that there was an indication of use, but again, if you look at the land use table, right? Um, and if I could, can I share my screen for a moment? Would, if that would be helpful. Actually, yeah, I, I think I'm just going to rely on Alex to provide us. I'm, I'm, all I'm looking for is where was Alex coming from? When okay, you fair enough, fair enough. So, I mean, in, in this particular situation, we rely on what the ordinance says and you know, under piers, docks, wharf bridges, and other structures and uses extending over or beyond the normal high water line or within a wetland, there's temporary and there's permanent. A permanent is a structure which will remain in or over the water for seven months or more in any period of 12 consecutive months. Um, the table, um, you know, lists who is uh, the permitting authority. Then if you go to that particular section in the ordinance, it has standards specific to piers, docks, wharfs, bridges, and all that other good stuff, which is 15C. Um, it's listed as other structures, and I believe the intent here, and this is something, you know, I've had conversations with Jeff Kalinich at DEP. The intent is to treat it as a structure because a retaining wall at the shore to correct a stabilization or a uh, erosion control issue usually is at or below the normal high water line. So that puts it below the normal high water line um, for more than seven months a year, which makes it a permanent structure or other structure. Uh, and that's the interpretation that I've relied on. Okay, thank you. Uh, for number six, uh, removal of vegetation less than three feet in height. Uh, we have the shoreland zoning reference, and then you also, in the beginning of that section, listed you know your own comments. Was the first word in this where it says all existing vegetation is all just an unfortunate use of words? Yeah, it definitely is, and that's what I was trying to get at with Leah earlier. It's like I, I you know, I understand exactly where you're coming from on that clearly all is not the best word choice for that and that is an oversight on our part uh, two more questions alex uh, for number five construction of a beach without a permit uh, it appears that there was a beach there previously can you construct something that's already there or i would pose it in a question like this if you have a beach that's covered with large rocks and you bring in sand to cover those rocks, do you feel as though that would be beach construction? Maybe the beach is already there and there's large rocks on it, but have you improved the beach? Have you done any activity, any construction activity to that beach? Now, if you go down there and you have a beach that's covered with large rocks, maybe six to 12 inches in diameter, and you go down and you pluck those rocks out, you remove those rocks. Are you improving and, and continuing to construct an improved beach? And that's how I looked at it. Um, yes, there was, you know, an area that's flat for them to sit on and hang out. Um, but did they actually go down? And was there construction to that area to improve it? That's the question I asked. And to me, there. Do you view Pat just? Oh, that's good. And um, David, David, I think one thing, sorry, I, I, we're not saying they created a new beach, right? That's, that's how I think I can best answer you. We're not saying there's a new beach here. They may have had a beach before, but there was improvement activity to that beach without a permit is what we're saying. Okay, very good. My last question, Alex, is for number eight, uh, permitted shoreline stabilization, no permits there's been mention of this permit by rule 
Um, I'm not sure if this is the appropriate place to ask it, but how does a permit by rule come into play? So they applied for a permit by rule, I believe in July of 2021. Um, under the process for a permit by rule, you submit this application to the state. And if you hear nothing within two weeks, you are approved. Um, Alexis Tavavlos and DEP reached out um, a few weeks after they submitted it to let them know that the application um, had not been approved and was marked deficient. I believe they exceeded the length allowed. You're only allowed to do 100 feet of shorefront and they were proposing much more than 100 feet with the two contiguous properties. They were, I believe, um, their opinion was that because the two properties were together, they thought they could do 100 on each to do a, a grand total of 200, I think. I don't wanna get too much into this because that's DEP and I wasn't involved in that. All I know is from what we were told by Alexis, they did not have um, an approved permit for what took place on site. Thank you, Alex. That's it for me. Any other board members, you have questions for Alex? Great. Yeah, I have a question on um, number uh, five and back to the beach. Um, perhaps you could pull up the before and after photos on that um either sure and anybody what's wild card <clears throat> all right so the beach yep yeah so leah did a pretty good job i think it kind of establishing a timeline i just want to verify the timeline of these photos so actually if you could zoom out so we can compare the uh i'm, I'm looking at the um the water line and what is likely the, the the time in which these photos were taking place can you mm -hmm. can you explain the before photo when was that taken the before photo was taken in august of 2021 the after photo was taken october 2021 okay so there's a substantially lower um, water line in general between those two times of the year yeah so you've got this rock down here which looks to be somewhere around here. Okay. So I guess what I'm wondering is where are all these dark rocks here? That should be right here. Yeah. And, and are you suggesting that those were covered in the app? Well, in the photos that Leah showed earlier from yesterday, there's now rocks in here that were not there in October of 2021. So I don't know if the sand that was here has eroded away. Um, yeah. So I'm trying to figure out maybe with you here at the same time, how in August of 21, it looked like this up here. And then in October looked like this. And then now today again, looks like this, <laughs> if yeah. that makes any sense. I mean, sand kind of does, does come and go a little bit on a beach. It, it's not necessarily mm -hmm. guaranteed that but... Hey, Alex, yeah. this is Tom. Hey, okay. Tom. Okay. So, um, so, so all the black rocks disappeared. And then what Leah showed us of today's photos, there's new rocks thrown in there from some source. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that what I, my takeaway is? Someone threw in some additional rocks and... Well, I don't really know what the what the conclusion is on that. I mean, the, the other possibility is you can get a permit from DEP to rake sand out from the lake um, up onto the beach. Although it doesn't look like there's much down here for sand. It looks like you got a lot of rocks right here. Um, so you can go in and rake some of that out if you have an existing beach. I don't know that that happened. Um, I don't know. Wave action could have pushed sand up but again i just if this was all sand here i would say that's possible but where is where did all of this sand here come from is the question for me like i, I said to dave a minute ago um i'm not arguing there was no beach i think there was a beach i think there has been some type of activity that's taken place on the beach that has improved it and that's that's why they were given the notice of violation I see, but you you can see that there's a certain problem. There's a certain amount of flux in the in the change, natural change of, of a beach anyway, and and what I guess what you're saying is it, your opinion is that it exceed, exceeded that threshold. 
Yeah, yeah. Based on what we saw when we went down in October of 2021, we felt there was a significant change that had taken place. Okay. And then uh, I have just one other question on, um, I always get, this is always a tricky one for me, but uh, six and seven, if we could pull up an example of a violation of six, discrete violations of six and seven, um, where um, they're not kind of overlapping. Um, I, 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 I think just in particular, I, I have a hard time understanding the distinction. I know you're referencing different ordinances. Um, I just was hoping you could you could point out specifically um, where where six was uniquely violated and where seven was uniquely violated. Yeah, so um, seven is the table. Um, so that's the actual activity without a permit. Um, mm -hmm. And then six is um, the actual removal for the project, um, for the erosion control project. So you can, like I had said before, you can remove vegetation less than three feet in height for an allowed use or permitted project. Um, and that's allowed. Uh, in this case, there was no permit issued. Had they gotten a permit for the stabilization, that tree removal would have been allowed. Um, but they didn't get a permit for that. Um, and then they didn't get a permit for just the tree removal for that, uh, sorry, for vegetation less than three feet in height. So people often will apply for a permit just to remove vegetation less than three feet in height within 100 feet, which is not allowed. The only time it's allowed, like I said, is for permitted use or if you're creating a six foot wide meandering path for the water. Now that removal doesn't necessarily mean you're going in and pulling up, you know, what's there. It can be trimming it. It can be covering it. Um, it could be putting a tarp over it for six months. Um, you know, all sorts of different things. Now, I don't think that's going to answer your question based on how I've seen you um, handle this one in the past. But what I will say, I'm going to go back to my, my old one. Let's say, uh, theoretically, they went down there and they built a house 25 feet from the water. Um, and they didn't get any permits to do it. There's multiple sections in the ordinance they would be in violation of. It's one activity. The building the house is that one activity. But they would be in violation of the 100-foot setback. And they'd also be in violation of the requirement to um, get a permit. So we have to, when there's a violation that takes place, we have to look at the ordinance and determine out of this, you know, couple hundred page document um, where all the violations are and which sections they're in violations of, in violation of. Um, so that's why we approached it that way. But is it fair to say if they had a permit, then both of those violations would go away? Yeah. I think all of them would, most of them. But but for the for the vegetation less than three feet, right? Yeah. Right. Yes. So then, yeah. I mean that that's I just uh, I'm having is a there a is there a that, situation? Whoops, sorry. Go ahead. No, I understand that when there's specific subcategories, like there's a point system for trees, there's canopy coverage, there's there's like um, you know erosion control, and then there's just move, certain thresholds of moving earth that are kind of different specific things that you could uniquely violate this one i'm just i always and the reason why i'm bringing it up and i hate to i hate to belabor the point but i, I think I, this one i just six and seven seem really hard for me to tease apart and i, I was just hoping we would try it again uh i, I think we're kind of at a similar <laughs> juncture yeah yeah and i think you know one thing you said last time was um is there ever a possibility where someone could get a permit um for the activity and then still be in violation of the other one, right? Um, and they could get a permit to remove vegetation for less than three feet in height and then exceed what was allowed um, under that permit and be in violation of the specific standard, you know, exceeding what's allowed under that with having a permit in hand. Now, you probably argue that they then don't have a permit for that portion of the activity, I suppose, but that would probably be the only situation where that um, you know, would work. Yeah. I understand what you're saying. I'm not sure I'm quite moved that much <laughs> than my previous understanding, but I I, I get it. Uh, that's it for me. Dave, can I ask Alex, uh, Alex a question? Yep, please. So on the tree removal, um, 
even if it's permitted to be removed, you are not allowed to remove the stones, correct? That is correct, within 100 feet. Now you're allowed to grind them down? Correct. So do we know if them stones were removed or if they were covered or ground? Or? Um, we believe they were removed, at least the large stumps at the shorefront. And that was actually, I believe, in Mike Morse's um, submittal that uh, Eric brought up earlier that had me read from. Um, I think they actually removed a stump um, at the shorefront, and that was the reason for expanding the uh, boat ramp. That's all I have. Okay. Um, David, can I ask Alex one last question? Yeah, of course. Hey, Alex, I know that town owns um, several boat ramps on different lakes in the town of Raymond. Is, is there any of them that are 16 feet in width besides the Sebago Lake double ramp? Um, you know, that's a great question. I'm not sure, to be honest. I bet they're not. Just Yeah, yeah, I, probably I, not. I've, I've been to two or three of them, so just, just, just ammunition for you. Pete, did you have any questions? You're on mute, Pete. Yeah, I don't have any uh, specific questions for Alex, but I do have a comment that I'd like to make, if that's okay. Is this appropriate to do that? What do you have to say, Pete? <laughs> so I, I took a quick look at the uh, letters from Q team, and I just wanted to point out that the first letter does not make any specific reference to either property. But the second letter does specifically identify 18 foot. Thank you. <clears throat> so, Attorney Wagner, does this, I believe, what the three allow Attorney Rachin opportunity? Yes, Attorney Rachin, and then I turn it over to Attorney Braun and members of the public. Okay, good. Attorney Rachin. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to state for the record, because I'm required to do so, uh, to preserve any issues that I, or concerns I have, is um, I just wanted to make clear that I don't think it's appropriate for board members to be advising the code officer about ammunition that they should have. Um, and I think that that's inappropriate, and I'm just re registering that as a, a possible indication of bias or due process. Um, so I, I will leave it at that, but I do need to register that for the record. Um, I just have a couple follow-up questions, if I could, for Alex. Um, I think on a couple of occasions that I, I, I wrote these words down, so I, if, if I, I think they're correct, but you said that the riprap was replaced or removed. I think you said that um, both of those things could be true. And I just want to go back to a picture of the uh, property itself. Um, Let's look at this. I'm going to share my screen in just a minute. Can you see my screen here? Yep. Yes. Okay. And so clearly, I mean, we've got quite a large boulders here. Um, fair to say those would be pretty hard to remove. Or let me let me ask a different question. Um, what evidence do you have that the existing riprap was in any way removed? I mean, did you look underneath the, the new riprap that covered it to maintain it or? or do you no, have any no. Okay. I, I did not look underneath okay. the new riprap, no. So to the extent that you said it's replaced or removed, we don't, we don't know that's the case, correct? I mean, we would rely on you to let us know if there's anything different than what we're saying. I mean, if it's, if it hasn't been replaced or removed and it's been covered over, then that would be good to know. Okay, so that you, I, I'm going to ask my question again. Do you have any evidence to suggest it has, in fact, been replaced or removed? Um, no, I guess we don't, um, unless you want to help us with that. Okay, so the next question um, I wanted to ask you about is with respect to the boat ramp. And I'll pull up some pictures of that if I can. There we are. 
And I think you had men mentioned a couple times, you talked about how its pitch has changed or its slope has changed. Can you just um, talk about what your basis is for that? Did you measure the slope or what are you basing that on? Uh, based on where that boat ramp lands on the before photo, um, it's much further back. Did you measure it at all? Yeah. With, how did you measure that? With what? Based on visually, I mean, looking at that. Okay. So no, no, I think you had mentioned, you know. Um, how would we measure, how would we measure that with the survey equipment or what, what would you accept for a measurement on that? I, I'm asking you if you did measure it. I'm not suggesting options. I, I, and I heard you say no. Well, I mean, move on. How, what would be a measurement, I guess, is my question, because it's possible we did measure it then, depending on what you're looking for. Um, you talked about how, um, I think you said you believed that there were stumps removed. And I think you mentioned that there was one place in particular near the boat ramp, but with respect to all of those other trees, um, do you have any evidence to suggest that those stumps were removed? Um, I believe we do. Let me just take a look. And while you're doing that, um, well, go ahead, I'm sorry. I don't want to interrupt you. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, best evidence I think we have would be under Exhibit F, which shows um, no stumps. But but those stumps can be ground to to um, the level of. of yeah, I don't I don't believe stump. they were no. Based on what though? Is what I'm uh, testimony from Rob Durant on site. Okay, and what about the evidence? I believe of. And I don't understand. I, I just that wouldn't make sense to me why they would remove one or two, but not all, when you're gonna be uh, stabilizing a, a bank, you're not going to put uh, filter fabric and riprap over um, you know, tree stumps. But isn't it your testimony that's what- No, I'm, I'm saying they have removed the tree stumps. Okay, but, but you didn't, have you observed any um, sort of areas in the, the land that show that there's a, a, a gap that usually when st stumps are removed, it's my understanding that there's some, I forget the word, but um, you can see in the land that there's a depression there. Well, unfortunately the site was completely altered and filled and graded. So there's not going to be very much evidence after the fact. Um, you know, the site was very soft. I can tell you that um, it was not, as firm as it would be if there was, um, you know, 12 or 10 stumps holding a bank together. Okay. Um, one question was going to the PBR. And my understanding with permit by rule is that when an application is made to the state, that towns are notified. In fact, I believe that states that on the application itself. Were you notified by the DEP of the, um, of the application? No, nope, the state does not notify the towns, even though it's on the form. And we, okay, so you're saying as a practical matter, even though the permit actually says that they do, they do not? Correct. And you did not, in this instance, receive notification? Nope, I saw all this in October. Okay. And regarding the Google Earth, um, I'm gonna just circle back on that, the measurements that you used with respect to Google Earth. Mm -hmm. And my, for some reason, can you bring yours up, that Exhibit F to the Notice of Violation? Would you be so kind to do that? Yep. Um, it looks like you'll need to stop screen sharing first. Oh yes, of course, sorry, thank you. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us when that was actually taken? Yeah, this is a 2018 aerial photo. Okay. And those measurements that you put on there, you talk about mm -hmm. these bubbles, right? Um, yep. Just so I understand, you talk about bubbles, but it, it really is supposed to be a grid, correct? There's like that. Okay. Yeah. Um, and these don't look like grids to me. They, they, they 
they are not the sort of the I think it's the 25 by 50. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so you'd agree with me that a grid is, tends to be a, a, squ a square rectangular Absolutely. area. Okay. Yep. Um, so with respect to Google Earth, I see that you, you, you put these on, you drew these, right? These measurements here. Yep. And are yep. you, how do you know, you know, the margin of error with Google Earth? I don't know. No one's ever questioned it. Okay. And that's the scale, um, with respect to camera height and such, um, doesn't that make a difference as to what the scale is? Yeah, but that's usually calculated based on the height. That's how it works. At least that's my impression of the technology. All right. And the after photos that you have, you don't have Google Earth after photos, correct? That we uh, the area? Not, not included with the NOV, no. Okay. All right. A couple more things. Um, I'm trying to find that picture of the boat ramp at the bottom, right? Mm -hmm. And you talked about how there'd been some filling there. Yep. And again, the violation, I think, references uh, um, at or on or below the high water mark, correct? Mm -hmm. So tell me um, where the high water, can you on that picture point out to me where the high water mark is? Actually, I want to find a photo. Oh, here it is. Yeah, if you would do that. Um, so this particular day, it would be here. Okay, so I, how on any given day, I thought that the high water mark was what the high water mark was. I think, like you mentioned that website. And doesn't that website sort of specify 266, or I can't remember what the numbers are, but are you suggesting that the high water mark changes on any given day? It changes depending on what the town's ordinance says. And our ordinance doesn't specifically take the elevation of the water. Okay. So when you put this, this line in that you put in, what are you basing that on? Basing it on um, where the water is right there. Uh, I can tell you observed change in vegetation is going to put the high water mark much higher. So that would be up here. But realistically, that's not the normal high water mark. So in this type of situation, the way we handle it is we accept a surveyor's decision on where that mark is, which they did do. Okay, and so this lower mark here is, is the surveyor's decision? Nope. nope, that was ours based on our site visit that day, okay. having to determine a location. Okay. All right. I think as far as cross-examination, um, that is it for me. My understanding is, is that Greg will now go, and then I'll have a chance to summarize. I would say uh, Greg would go. I would then give an opportunity for uh, Attorney Wyckoff if he has any re-examination, and then uh, you as an applicant, uh, appellant would have the last, last word. Thank you so much. So, Attorney Wagner, when, when's the best time to open this up to the public? We don't have any members of the public, but... Uh... Well, I, I would turn it over to Attorney Braun and then the public after that. Very good. So, Attorney Braun? Sure. So I'm going to say. Um, gonna touch on an awful lot uh, that Leah has already touched on. So I'll try hard not to be repetitive. Uh, but um, to the extent that I am, it's important, I think, to, to make sure the, the record establishes certain facts. And so I, I just I just want to confirm uh, some of the statements or uh, testimony you previously gave. Uh, first, you indicated that you have no background or training as an environmental engineer. Is that correct? That is correct. Code officers are not required to be. Okay. And you have no background or uh, education uh, in surveying. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, code officers are not required to be. Okay. And uh, similarly, no background or education in geology. That is correct. Code officers are not required to be. Uh, and no background or education as a civil engineer? That is correct. We are not required to be. Right. And so the extent of your training uh, and uh, knowledge base here, uh, you indicated was based on your state certification uh, to become a code enforcement officer, correct? Yep. All correct. right. When did you obtain that certification? Uh, 2015, I believe. 
are you uh, required to do any sort of a continuing education uh, to maintain that certificate? Yep, we are. I was actually recertified in January, I believe. All right. And, uh, and as part of that certification in your position, uh, are there any uh, uh, sorts of best practices uh, that uh, the office requires or obligates you to follow? Uh, no, we just need to make sure that we maintain the amount of uh, continued education credits per year that we need to to keep the, the license active. All right. Surely it, it teaches you and gives you some idea of how to do your job, correct? Yep. All right. And so based on your training, uh, when you're advised that the violation may have taken place, uh, what does that training tell you you should do? Uh, we need to uh, basically notify the um, violator that the violation has taken place. And? And then tell them to stop work. So your training then, your testifying doesn't uh, provide you any sort of instruction or uh, guidance on how to determine whether or not a violation, a violation is actually taking place? Um, well, yeah, we must use the ordinance to determine that. All right, and the, and the ordinance tells you what uh, is legal and what is not legal, correct? Yep. Okay. But what does your training tell you or how does it instruct you to determine whether or not that law or ordinance, ordinance has, has been followed or not? I guess I don't know how to answer that question, Greg. Okay. So I'm just trying to clarify here that, that through your code enforcement officer training, uh, you can't speak to any specific protocol that you learned as it relates to establishing whether a violation was, was, took, took place or not? Yeah, there's a CEO handbook that the state issues. And what does it say as it relates to establishing whether a violation has taken place or not? I don't know that off the top of my head. Okay. Did you review it before you went out and saw this property? Uh, we, yeah, we often will review that when we are Did looking for different, you know, procedures and okay. rules. Did you do it before you went out and looked at this property? Uh, when specifically? Well, I guess uh, you, you indicated you went out on October 26, 2021, uh, based on some photos and reports that you received. Did you yeah. review uh, your code enforcement handbook as it related to how to establish whether a violation had taken place? I did not review the CEO handbook on October 26th, no, 2021. And in fact, you uh, testified that when you went out to the property on October 26th, you brought no equipment with you whatsoever. That's not true now. Uh, that's not what you testified to? That's not what I testified to now. Okay, well then uh, clarify that. What did you bring with you when you went out to the site? I had a cell phone. Okay. Yeah, that's... All right, so... Uh, I asked, no uh, pad. Equipment, and, and the extent of your equipment was you brought your cell phone with you. That's what you're testifying. Yeah, that's what I had in my pocket. But of course, we do keep a toolbox with tape measure, pop level. We keep all of this stuff in the car. Of course, we have all that stuff with us. Okay. Notepad, right on the phone. Camera, right on the phone. Measurement tool, right on the phone. Okay. So you brought all of that with you? Yeah. Okay. Uh, how many times have you been out to the, to the property? Three. Have you ever asked for permission to visit the property and been denied? No. How far is it from the office, just roughly? About 20, 25 minutes. Okay. And so you've been out there three times. Uh, at no point have you ever been told you couldn't visit the property. Yep. It's in close proximity to your place of work. Yep. You bring tools with you when you go. Yep. And yet... In all of those visits and in all of these processes, you never once took a single measurement, did you? Of course we did. Have you Using not have phone. you not been listening? I mean, we've we we've, we've taken measurements. Using your cell phone. We've taken all sorts of different measurements. And Using yes, they've been on a cell phone. Not okay. just a cell phone, Greg. Did you at any point pull out the tools that were in your toolbox? Yes. Okay. So when you were asked earlier what kind of measurements you took and you did not indicate that you used a tape measure or a level or any other tools, that was not true? I guess I don't see how that's relevant. 
Well, I'm, I'm trying to determine how, in <laughs> fact, you came up with the measurements that you came up with. Which I've already told you and the board and Leah. So exclusively then using your cell phone? No. What other methods did you use? We use Google Earth measurement as well. Okay, Google Earth. Um, in your code enforcement officer certification class and continuing education that you take, does it discuss the use of this iPhone app to measure distances? No. Is there any training program related to that app? No. Okay. Uh, in your code enforcement certification course, did it discuss using Google Earth to establish measurements to determine no. if a violation is it? No. Okay. Are there any training courses related to it? Yes. To Google Earth? Yes. Have you been certified in a Google Earth training course? I have not. Okay. Uh, are you aware uh, of any studies or evaluations that determine the uh, um, accuracy of these programs? Yeah. Okay. Can you please uh, clarify or expand upon those? Uh, if you want to give me a few minutes to pull it up, I can. All right. So currently you have not. Is that correct? I had not off the top of my head, no. Okay. And in fact, you indicated that you had run a personal test related to this iPhone app. Is that correct? Yes. That in the past, you would run a tape measure and then walked it to establish whether or not the distance was the same. Yes. And, and you found that it was the same. More accurate. To, more accurate than to tape. Extent, yeah. Correct? Yes, because you understand horizontal measurement, correct? Correct. So right. there was a difference in the length that the Google or that the iPhone app told you and what your tape measure told you. Is that correct? Right, because the tape measure is not completely level, correct? Okay. So do you think there's any risk? Uh, in in relying exclusively on your iPhone app and Google Earth to make these measurements and determine whether or not a violation has taken place? Absolutely not. None whatsoever? No, absolutely not, no. Th these are records that you can rely on or measurements that you can rely on? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, and, and it, you think it's fair then to say that online databases like this are accurate, correct? Yeah. Okay. So I have, like I have no, no uh, issues with confidence when it comes to the measurements that we've taken on site. Sure. So if I can, uh, and I don't know how to share the screen, I guess I'd ask real quick just to have permission to do that. Greg, uh, yes, you have permission. I'm going to ask that we take like a two minute break. I need to step away briefly and come right back. Okay. I apologize for this. But kind of stepped away. We all good with taking a two minute break. I'd like to finish this line of questioning before I, I, I would love to allow that for you, but I, I got to step away for a few minutes and I'll be right back. <clears throat> Okay, thank you for your patience and I apologize for the interruption. Turn it on, please continue. Uh, so where we last left off, I just asked Alex uh, about his belief and trust in these online databases and systems. Uh, and I'd asked if you would please uh, allow me to share my screen. Yeah, from, the, from my perspective, please go ahead. Well, I got to do it. I don't know if I can. Let's see here. Okay. All right. So we'll just go ahead and take this exhibit F. Uh, this comes from your notice of violation. It's one of the attachments, correct? Yes. All right. And uh, you've been asked a lot about these uh, clouds. Uh, that you drew in on this picture. But I want to specifically draw your attention to the white lines that are here. Um, okay. Those indicate uh, property lines, correct? That's the tax map overlay, yep. And you indicated that those are wrong, did you not? Incorrect, yep. Yeah, so this is an online system. 
that taxpayers, in fact, use to establish ostensibly their property lines, and you've used it as an exhibit here, knowing that the property boundaries it indicates are wrong. Is that correct? Uh, it's a tax map overlay. Um, I'm sure you understand tax maps are often incorrect. The tax map and the property lines don't have anything to do with the exhibit. Well, they're here for some reason, correct? Yeah, because I have the KMZ filed and installed on my uh, Google, uh, Google Earth so I can find properties easier. Um, it has nothing to do with 25 by 60 foot uh, canopy opening. Um, well, I'm not asking about that. And so you, you indicated that well, these just over kind of are. May You're I? asking why it's part of the exhibit. I'm telling okay. you why it's part of the exhibit. All right. And, and you just indicated that these white lines and this overlay, in fact, are part of Google Earth, correct? They are part of Google Earth, but they're yeah, tax they're map lines. They're tax map lines, just like we have the parcel maps. What would I have done to, to, to show this violation? I could have drawn this on a tax map, not use the image overlay. Okay. What could you have done to demonstrate and show this violation? It's a good question, Alex. That is a really good question. So, all right, let's come back here. Let's look at before and after, right? These are befores and these are afters. Can you indicate in these after pictures where you used a tape measure or another physical device? Uh, I, I'm not gonna not gonna carry that on because it's ten o'clock. But here's listen. I'll explain. I'll answer your question. I was going to, but you you interrupted. Um, I use the tools that I have available to me to display where I found the violation and how I found the violation. I use those tools that you keep mentioning, and uh, I feel like I did a pretty good job with displaying where they're in violation of that. Um, can't be opening. So it's it, it's it's an honest statement then that at no point did you use a tape measure or another physical device to measure any distance on this property. We had a tape measure on site, but you did not use it. In fact, Jeff Kalinich and Chris Hansen were on site a week after this picture was taken, and they measured everything with a tape measure. All right, but you did not. My assistant went for me because I was in a meeting. All right, and her measurements are not included in your notice of violation. Yes, they are. All right. Can you How do you think we put that together? We used measurements from on site. Now, Chris has been to the property more than three times. He is my assistant. He went and took some of these photos. Uh -huh. but I signed it. You used an iPhone to make these measurements. Greg, you just wasted the last 10 minutes trying to make a point that I didn't actually pull a tape measure on site. I'm telling you, my assistant pulled a tape on site with the Shoreland Zoning Coordinator for DEP. Okay. So let's Just look. Drop it. Let's look at the before and after photo photos here in the B. Uh, you indicated the stairway here uh, is still present, correct? This that stairway was in this picture used as reference. That's right. Uh, but but the size of it uh, is just an estimate based on your best guess of what a standard uh, uh, commercially available stairway might be, correct? Yeah. Your previous testimony was that you did not That's measure correct. that yes. stairway. That's correct. We were not there. We were not able to measure the well, old boat ramp because your client pulled it up without getting a permit. Sure. Correct. Uh, correct. So, but you've used it, right? This good faith, best guess analysis to ascertain or establish what you think not only these measurements are across here but also what this new ramp might be. Is that correct? No, we pulled that right from, from Mike's uh, document as we displayed earlier. All right, so you're saying you measured this physically yourself to establish- We have measurement, yes. Did I did not myself, no, but I had my assistant go do it, which is totally fine. All right, and, and, and yet we don't have an accurate measurement of what that width is, do we? We do, it's 16 feet. And where does that, where do you indicate that in your notice of violation? It's not in the notice of violation. Okay, why is that? It didn't need to be. You indicated that this has been extended. Uh, and when asked for an accurate determination of how wide it's been extended, you've only given best guesses and not included any specifics in the violation. You don't think that was necessary or relevant information? I still think it's a violation regardless. Okay. So you think that no one has been able to, to prove that wrong, I guess, at this point. Okay. 
take a look at uh, exhibit C here. Similarly, um, it sounds like at no point did you walk down to the beach and actually measure physically the distance either from the water to the stones or across from one side to the other. That's an accurate statement, correct? Yeah, I don't see why I would need to do that. All right. Well, you've alleged that a beach has been expanded or that's built. not what we alleged. That's incorrect. That's not what what, what did we allege, Greg? All right, let's take a look here. So if I'm looking at because I've stated it twice tonight. Mm -hmm. This right. Notice the violation five construction of a beach without a permit. And you have alternatively indicated that either sand may have been brought in to increase the size of that beach, or that rocks have been removed to increase the size of that beach. And yet you've just testified that you didn't think taking a measurement of that beach to establish its size. I've said twice. You know, I've, I've, been not, very, not, I've been very patient here. You are, you know, the tone you're taking with him is insulting and offensive. Yeah, I, I agree. You've mischaracterized agree. his testimony. And I object to that multiple times. My tone. I, I'm just trying to establish what actions he took on the property to uh, uh, reasonably and effectively measure uh, these dimensions. You've been right. taking his testimony and twisting it and misrepresenting what it is. Well, I disagree. Uh, you, you, Greg, I'm sure you do. I've said I'd twice. I'd ask treat him with more respect. I've said twice tonight. I actually literally said like probably an hour ago, I'm not saying the beach has been made any larger. So I don't know why we're talking about the beach needing to be measured. So, so you no agree sense. With and it's made. wasting everyone's time and it's disrespectful. So let's move on. All right. Um, let's see here. Similarly, we're going to take a look. All right. So I'm, I'm curious here, what is the square footage of these clouds that you've uh, drawn? If you, if you guys want to take another five minute break, I can give you the exact number. I don't right. have that prepared right now. You have not done that math previously. I can tell you what 25 by 60 is. All right, but is that a rectangle? That's 1,500 square feet. So that cloud is larger than 25 by 60. So I'm going to tell you, this is probably around 1,700 square feet. Now, that's not an exact number, but it's much larger than 250 square feet. Therefore, that's a violation. That's an estimate, right? Again, you didn't actually measure that section. We're just if you, giving Greg, if, you wanna, if we can take a five-minute break, um, I will get that number for you. All right. Um, So I think you testified as it related to notice the violation one. When you were asked about the cubic yards uh, and how much had actually been brought in or not, um, that in trying to establish how much that was, you didn't actually pick up or look up, look under any of the riprap to establish how deep it was. Is that correct? Uh, no. Okay. Um, and, and when it related to topsoil uh, and mulch or other uh, material put in there um the the form of measurement you took was to kick it with your foot is that that was what your testimony was is that correct yes we could take the length and the width and multiply that by a centimeter and it would still exceed 10 cubic yards how many inches is a centimeter i don't know off the top of my head i can look it up if you'd like well, I, you just suggested that that was sufficient to cover it. I didn't know if maybe you'd done that math. Um, all right. It's very easy to find this information. It's all out there. The high water mark. I think you indicated that generally uh, you obtain a survey to establish what that high water mark is. Is that correct? Uh, that's what the property owner did, yep. All right, so you relied on the property owner's survey to establish that? No, no. As I said earlier, we relied on the watermark the day of when it came to determining where the high water mark was. All right, but you acknowledge that, that changes day to day? Yeah. 
Um, the uh, the lake, um, it doesn't have like tides, right? Correct. Yeah. Uh, but the water level does change depending on the time of year. Yes. Okay. Why does it change? Uh, it's regulated by a dam. All right. And so water is let in or or let out of the lake. Yes. All right. And and there's actually a website that you can go to to determine uh, what the level is. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. But your testimony here is that you did not take that step. Correct. Are you aware of our definition for normal high water line? I'm just asking what steps you took to make those measurements. Right. But uh, to answer your question, I'm asking, do you know what our definition for normal high water line is? Uh, yeah. No, you probably have to look it up, right? Yeah, that's what I usually do all day long, too. So the definition for normal high water line says the line, which is apparent from visible markings, changes in the character of soils due to prolonged action of the water or changes in vegetation and which distinguishes between predominantly aquatic and predominantly terrestrial land. Areas contiguous with rivers and great ponds that support non-forested wetland vegetation and hydric soils and that are at the same or lower elevation as the water level of the river or great pond during the period of normal high water are considered part of the river or great pond, period. There's nothing in there about elevation marks or elevation points or dam regulation. It's based on those changes visible. It doesn't say anything about requiring a survey to come up with that number or that height. And you took no measurement of it when you were on the property. It was based solely on your visual perception. How would I measure that other than a photograph? I am not a surveyor. I don't have survey equipment with me. How would I measure the normal high water mark with something other than a photo? You were physically on the property. Yes. And? And you brought a toolkit with you, yes. And? Is that, is that true? We've already determined that, so let's not waste everyone's time. Please move on. It had a, a tape measure at least in it, correct? Yes. And you didn't use any of those tools to try to establish that, correct? Uh, Mr. Chair, established what? this is getting a little ridiculous. How can I determine I, I, I have normal no high water mark with a tape measure? For crying out loud, that's ridiculous. Craig, Craig can you that's move ridiculous. on from this? I, I think that we have gotten clear testimony it's about embarrassing. how we made a determination of the normal high water line. So I'm not sure what the line of questioning here is really sure. adding. All right. Uh, so I'll move on to um, uh, point uh, or, or notice of violation number eight and, and nine here collectively. Um, I, I'm hoping you can explain to me what you believe section 15, subsection C, 12 requires as it relates to work uh, on a shoreline. All right, hold on. So 15. Yep, just uh, notice eight and nine, um, the quoted text there. Yep. All right, vegetation may be removed in excess of the standards in section 15Q of this ordinance in order to conduct shoreline stabilization of an eroding shoreline provided that a permit is obtained from the planning board. Construction equipment must access the shoreline by barge when feasible as determined by the planning board. That section? That's it. Okay. Okay. Uh, continue. When necessary, the removal of trees and other vegetation to allow for construction equipment access to the stabilization site via land must be limited to no more than 12 feet in width. When the stabilization project is complete, the construction equipment access, uh, sorry, when the stabilization project is complete, the construction equipment access way must be restored. Okay. So you've alleged it's a violation to complete this work from the land uh, and, and not a barge absent a permit. What, yes. What, what in this, in this provision indicates that the work has to, has to be completed and done from a barge. It needs to be, the planning board must make that determination. And the work was done from land without approval from the planning board, without well, that I, permission. I, I'm, I'm looking for clarification here. And, and I mean, and I'm, I'm not gonna lie, like this, this verbiage is new to me, so maybe I'm missing something, but what I see in a couple instances here is the word access, right? And, and not only access, but it indicates that if access needs to be made from the land, 
that the width of the path to access the work zone cannot be any wider than 12 feet. And when the project is completed, the access way must be restored. And so this seems to me to be a provision related to how you get the equipment there, not how the work is actually done. And I'm looking for some clarification from you as to why you believe whether or not the work is done when a uh, uh, um, uh, when the equipment is on a barge as, as opposed to being on land. Um, that determination must be made by the planning board. Unfortunately, your client didn't apply for a permit by the planning board. Um, so I really can't give you much more uh, clarification on that. So, so can you, so, so you agree then that at least you, you can't clearly point out to me where it says in this provision or this ordinance that work needs to be completed from a barge service. Say that again, sorry. I, I'm sure. So I, I'm still just trying to see within this ordinance where it indicates that work would need to be done from a barge and how this doesn't simply apply to how you get your equipment to the job site. Construction equipment must access the shoreline by barge when feasible as determined by the planning board. That's right. the violation. And so you take that to mean that, that unless the permit authorizes otherwise, the, the construction equipment would need to remain on a barge in the water and not actually on the land. Uh, that's up for the planning board to determine through their approval process. All right. But, but, okay. I wouldn't, I wouldn't make that call. That would be the planning board would review that under their application, you know, for a site plan. Um, regarding the tree removal, um, you've done a lot of work with, uh, um, or you've been involved in at least in a number of jobs with Rob Durant and, and Durant excavating in Big Lake Marine, correct? Yep. He doesn't hold himself out as an arborist, does he? Uh, he does cut trees. Yeah. Yep. Uh, He's not an arborist, but he does cut trees. All right. Um, you generally understand that this property uh, and the adjacent property to which we previously had hearings was, was considered one large project, correct? It, it went on to multiple property sites, but it appeared to be essentially the same job, correct? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, and you know that Q team did the work on the adjacent property, correct? Yep. All right. Is there a reason or can you explain the basis why you didn't cite Q team for cutting these trees and doing the work on this property? Um, I had a meeting with Q team about a week after we did the site visit. Um, and they told us at that point, um, that they did the work on Fernwood. They admitted to it. They sent us a letter confirming it. And they also stated that they had, uh, they weren't taking any ownership of the work that was done on 28 Whitetail. Uh, and that work was done by the contractor who did the site stabilization work. All right. And so they had their tree cutting equipment out there, correct? I don't know. I never saw it. Never saw it. All right. But they did tell you that they did the work on the adjacent property. That's what they said. Yeah. Right. And, and solely based on their testimony and, and um, um, indications to you, you chose to believe that you can do the tree cutting uh, on this property. No one's told me otherwise. All right. Well, we filed a notice of appeal that's indicated uh, Big Lake Marine didn't do the work. Did it? Okay. No. Did, is that what you're saying? Big Lake Marine didn't do the work? Yes, that, that's what we've alleged. That's what our appeal indicates is that is that they did not do the work as it related to the tree cut. Okay. Okay. Uh, just one final question. When, when you went out there um, on October 26th, um, you uh, you communicated orally uh, to uh, uh, Rob Durant and the other people there that they should stop work on the project. Is that correct? Yeah. All right. Uh, at any point, did you actually issue a written stop work order? Um, not not written uh, in the heading, but the we we know we basically. Sorry, I'm getting tired. 
Um, I'm very popular tonight, so I'm getting a little tired. Um, we gave him a verbal stop work order and the communication that we gave him at that point was we're going to be sending you a notice of violation. And the intent through that was they're, they're one and the same. It, is that standard procedure uh, for the town of Raymond? No, I wouldn't say it's standard procedure. We do it differently. Sometimes um, it's written a little differently, but just for this particular situation, we you know, met with him on site and he told us he was done. He wasn't doing any more work. So I trusted that. I have no reason not to trust that. Um, and you know, as far as I know, he hasn't been back to do any work. So I think we're good. All right. And, and in fact, I think you testified that based on your observations and site visits, uh, no additional work was committed or completed on the property after yep. that October Correct. 26th. Day. All Correct. Right. Um, all right. Uh, apologies for getting your aisle, uh, Alex. I know it's been a late night and I thank you very much for uh, answering my questions. Yep. So Attorney Wagner, I'm yes, I would uh, turn it over to Attorney uh, Wyckoff if he has any re-examination. I do. Thank you. <clears throat> um, first, um, Alex, there are some um, testimony or some questions from Attorney Rachin about the riprap along the shoreline um, at the White Cell property. And my question for you is, if riprap was only added and wasn't removed or replaced, does that change the situation with any, um, the existence of any violations here? Mr. No. Chairman, before the answer to that, that question, I just wanted to ask Attorney Wagner perhaps to weigh in on a procedural issue. Um, again, the hour is late and I know we're all tired, but my recollection is, is that after I did my examination of the code enforcement officer, Attorney Wyckoff had an opportunity to redirect. Um, I did not. Okay. Then I'll stop and I will mute myself. Right. I don't know that you answered the question I asked, so I think, let me just ask it again. So there were some questions for you about riprap, and um, my question for you is: if riprap, rip, riprap, let's see if I can say it without well, tripping over my tongue here. If riprap was only added and not removed or replaced. Would that change whether any of these violations have occurred or not? No. Um, I'm going to go to Exhibit F. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Exhibit F here, it has the bubbles that show uh, the area of canopy that has been removed. Now, how do you, how do you know that greater than 250 square feet of canopy have been opened. Could you just describe how you know that? Yeah, um, it's very clear if you stand on site and you look up, uh, you know, especially on the right hand bubble where you see the um, deck that exists on site that wasn't on a subdivision plan in 2007. Um, you can see that that entire area was once canopy. That's now all open, basically back to the deck. Um, all of that. So anything that's there in that particular bubble is now gone. That adds up to greater than 250 square feet. Um, and same thing on the other side, we established a 25 foot uh, distance and it's actually greater than 60 feet um, on that side, but you know, we're calling it 60 to make it easier. Uh, it exceeds by a thousand square feet probably. Okay. I mean, what's 25 times 60? Do you know what that is? I don't. I don't do public math. Okay. Um, by rule, I'll represent to you. I'll represent to you. It's fifteen hundred. <laughs> I'll represent it's fifteen hundred square feet. Yeah. That more than two hundred and fifty square feet. Yeah, it is. Quite a by bit. By a factor. Of by a factor of six. Yeah. Okay. So, in other words, you were satisfied that there was far more than two hundred fifty feet of canopy opened up. Yeah. Okay. There is a question from Attorney Braun relating to um, cutting of trees at, at Whitetail Lane. And 
is really an issue relating to the Big Lake Marine appeal, but I just want to be clear about it because he raised and he asked the questions now, and I want to just get, I want to get it under, clearly understand from you about that. So you understood that uh, management controls had how many contracts working in this project? Two. Who are those? Um, Rob Durant, Big Lake Marine, um, Rob Durant, uh, construction, whatever it is, uh, and um, Q Team. And you met with someone from Q Team? Yes. And that was about the violations that occurred? Yes. And what did you understand from that meeting with Q Team? Yeah, uh, they came in and um, met with Chris and I. Uh, I want to say less than a week after October 26th. Um, and they told us that uh, there was an oversight. Uh, they usually obtain all the permits for their projects, but in this particular situation, uh, they didn't ensure that a, a permit had been pulled. They apologized. They admitted to doing uh, the work on uh, 18 Fernwood. And okay. we asked um, Robert Fogg uh, who did the work on 28 Whitetail. And he just kind of said, the contractor. And did they also talk to you about whether they cut small vegetation or not? Uh, they did. Um, and because that was something that was originally referenced and um, they, you know, his, his answer to us was, I think word for word was, you know, we're in the tree removal business. Those aren't trees. Um, you know, they're not going to waste their time with that, essentially. Okay. Now, th they sent you a letter, too, right? Mm -hmm. And do you recall what that letter said? Yeah. What did it say? Uh, they essentially said exactly what they said in, in uh, the meeting with us and that they were, um, you know, responsible for a certain amount of the work that had taken place. Um, and, you know, it's it was, uh, you know, an error that took place, and they were under the impression that, uh, a permit had been pulled. And, and your understanding from them is that they didn't do the tree removal at Whitetail and that Big Lake Marine did? Yes. And did you find them credible in them t describing that to you? Yeah. Yeah, I mean. Why? Why was why did you find them to be credible? Uh, I mean, they, they owned up to the work that they did do without permits. Um, I just, I guess... My impression of that would be, why would you admit to one but not the other? I, it seems a little odd. Um, and I have no reason not to believe, you know, what, what they were telling us. Um, you know, they've always been very good about um, following the rules and, and, and doing what they need to do. Uh, so I did believe that it was an oversight. Okay. I don't have any other questions. Thank you. Um. Attorney Wyckoff, I guess I would, do you have any uh, summary arguments before I uh, turn it over to Attorney Reagan? I don't recall if uh, you had had that opportunity. No, I haven't had the opportunity. And I guess I would just say, you know, we've, we've gone through in fairly gory detail about the existence of these violations. Um, and Alex has described how you know, the facts are lying these, these um, violations. And a number of arguments have been raised by management controls as to why those violations haven't occurred or why those violations are um, duplicative of, of each other. And for all of the reasoning employed by the ZBA at, in connection with the um, Fernwood violations applied to the facts here, um, those arguments about why the, the violations are duplicative and shouldn't, be, um, shouldn't exist should be rejected. And the ZBA should uphold the violations as uh, Alex Roy has described here today. Thank you. Okay. And um, Greg, or Attorney Braun, did you have any summary arguments? Okay. Uh, so then uh, I would get yeah, the last say. To the... say um, oh. I, I do that that it, it appears to me that, um, and again, argument, um, you know, what, what I ascertained from this is that, um, very little in the way of documentation or explanation uh, in the form of measurements uh, or, or clear uh, uh, explanation has been provided. Um, 
rather uh, the board is just being asked or, or it's being suggested that the thing speaks for itself. Uh, not only uh, in, in um, the extent or measurements uh, uh, in dimensions of the project and the property, uh, but also as it relates to some of the wording uh, in, uh, in these violations. Um, you know, we, we want to explain away all existing uh, vegetation less than a certain height as just, you know, we could have done it better, but we didn't. Um, you know, uh, access compared to completion uh, as it relates to uh, uh, violations number eight and nine, and, and they're not being a distinction. Uh, and, and to those points, I would argue, especially in a case like this, where uh, publicly the town has indicated that this is the most egregious thing they've ever seen. Uh, and, and, you know, potentially they're seeking millions of dollars in fines uh, that a higher level uh, of proof and explanation should be uh, required. Okay. Uh, attorney Rachel. Yeah. So I will just summarize and basically talk about the themes we've been talking about all along, but understanding that again, Whitetail is not turned but it's its own um, property and it should be treated and viewed as such. But, um, you know, the first argument, of course, is that the wrong person has been um, held responsible here or is being thought to be held responsible. And this notion that, you know, somehow management controls is an agent, or I should say the other way around, that Durant or Big Lake Marine is an agent of um, uh, management controls, is that's just legally incorrect. An independent contractor is just that. They're independent and they are not um, in, in an agency relationship. So that's incorrect. Um, the second theme that we've been talking about here is that heavy duplication. Um, and I do need, I know it's late, but I do need to talk about what that duplication is and talk about how these things should be consolidated. Um, when I say these things, I mean the, the violation. So as you know, the notice of violation actually alleges 12 separate violations. Um, many, if not most, are duplicative. We've argued before, and I'll renew this argument, that had um, they sought and received a shoreline stabilization permit under Section 15C12 of the ordinance, it would have covered many of the other purportedly single violations, such as earth moving and, and filling and vegetation and tree removal, all of those things would have been subsumed. And so um, we would respectfully request that all of those, meaning violations one and two relating to earth moving and filling, violations four regarding expansion of a shoreline, violation five regarding a purported beach construction, six and seven, which deal with red removal of vegetation, nine use of a barge, and 10 through 12 are tree um, removal, that those all be stricken entirely because they are subsumed under violation number eight. If, um, and that is our ask. Now, if the board decides that they are not going to strike, at least it's really important to understand the need for this consolidation because so many of these um, purportedly single violations are in fact one and the same. They're based on the same activity and often based on exactly the same provision under the ordinance. And I'll identify those quickly. Um, no, excuse me, violations number one and two um, basically should be consolidated because on the one hand, violation one simply states that it's earth moving and filling and in excess of 10 cubic yards. We know that that activity in and of itself is not a violation unless and until a person didn't get a permit. And that is what they allege in violation um, number two. And so those are exactly the same violation and they should be consolidated accordingly. Um, with respect to violation number four, which alleges an expansion of the shoreline without a permit, and number eight, which is an expansion of shoreline um, with riprap, this is the same thing, um, again, that would have been subsumed under a shoreline stabilization permit. So four and eight should be consolidated. Looking at violation number three, which is the expansion of the boat, of the boat launch, and violation four, which is expanding the shoreline, I think it's important. And the testimony of the CEO is actually very revelatory in this in this manner or in this way that both of the violations they ex they cite the exact same provision under the ordinance that would be fourteen seventeen sub b, um, and I think it's clear that the, the code enforcement officer said that the expansion of the shoreline 
the shoreline was limited to that area of where the boat launch was expanded. So again, even according to the code enforcement officer's own testimony, same activity, and therefore those violations should clearly be consolidated. Um, again, just like no, numbers, violations number one and two, violations number six and seven talk about an activity, which is actually permitted here, removal of vegetation, and then slaps them with a second violation for removal of that vegetation without a permit. Again, same activity should be consolidated. Um, numbers eight, violations number eight and number nine, eight being the unpermitted shoreline, excuse me, shoreline stabilization without a permit, and number nine being unpermitted st uh, stabilization without a barge. Again, those are both activities relating to unpermitted shoreline stabilization. They cite exactly the same provision of the ordinance and they should be consolidated. Um, and again, with respect to numbers 10, 11, and 12, all relate to vegetation and um, tree removal, same activity, should not be three separate and distinct violations. Um, so that is with respect to our arguments around duplication. Let me talk to you about the last round, and that is the fact that um, as alleged in the notice of violation, they, they simply, you know, we know the purpose of a notice of violation is to give notice of what the violation is. And here, it's been a long night, but the testimony and our, um, it's our respectful submission that the evidence just simply does not support a conclusion that many of these alleged violations occurred. And I'll be as quick as I can. But with respect to violations number one and two, again, that's the earth moving and filling of in excess of 10, of 10 cubic yards. The evidence does not establish that there was actually greater than 10 cubic yards. Um, you know, as, as as a lot of tests, there was a lot of testimony, a lot of questions about that, and that there was no empirical um, specific measurements in that regard, and therefore it was not established. With respect to violation number three, the boat launch has been expanded again. Um, the pictures that were shown you were from a, a great distance, they were fuzzy, there was no scale associated, and it was very difficult um, for them to establish that there was, in fact, that the, the, that area of the existing boat launch, and let's be clear, it was existing, no one's disputing that, that it was um, expanded beyond the scope of where it was originally. Um, with respect to violation number four, that being the alleged expansion or enlargement of the shoreline, um, first and foremost, we, there's some doubt as to whether or not this was a use or a structure as defined in the ordinance, but even if it were, the code officer did not provide measurements Again, like I said, he's saying that the expansion of the shoreline was exactly the same thing as the expansion of the boat launch. And so all of our arguments in that regard apply, that the evidence just does not support a conclusion um, that, that there was in fact an expansion there. Um, another piece of that is that it's important to understand that um, any addition of riprap we, I think we heard the, te the testimony of the code enforcement officer to say he didn't know and he couldn't establish that there was a removal or um, uh, I think he said a, a removal of the existing riprap. Rather, it was just something that was put on top. And as stated earlier, that it's our submission that under the, I think I believe it's section 12 of the ordinance that repair and maintenance of existing non-conforming structures or uses is permissible without a permit. Um, with respect to violation number five, um, I think it's clear the, ab the evidence absolutely does not support a conclusion that the beach was constructed. Those were the words used, constructed. It clearly already exists. And I think as the chair very eloquently stated, how can you construct something that's already there. Um, you know, even the, the code enforcement officers before photos show beach chairs. Clearly that was being used as a beach. Um, and to the extent that rocks were allegedly removed, again, the evidence doesn't say, I mean, even the code officer himself acknowledged that the, the uh, beaches are not static, the sand moves in, moves out. And so it, it just has not been established that a beach has been constructed constructed. And to the extent that improvements are somehow a construction, again, the sand
sand can move in, sand can move out. Code enforcement officer himself acknowledged that. Um, with respect to violations six and seven, that again is the removal of vegetation of less than three feet in height without a permit. Um, this is just another example of the town's overreach. As we highlighted, it talks about all existing vegetation. The evidence clearly shows that that is not the case. All existing vegetation has not been removed. Um, with respect to violation number eight, which is no permit for the stabilization project, um, the permit by rule covers actually a certain portion of that stabilization project. Also, um, as I noted before, that this was in the nature of maintenance, adding, you know, again, the, 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 the evidence is clear that this shoreline was very much characterized by extensive rip wrapping already. And so just adding some additional is in the nature of repair and maintenance, not um, an, an entirely new project. Also, I think the code enforcement officer testified, and I may not have his exact words, but where the water is, is where the high water level is. The normal high water mark is where the water is. But there's no evidence that there was stabilization below the normal high water mark. And if we look at the ordinance and the section that he is citing, it is talking about um, work below the high water mark. And so there's no evidence to, to establish that. Um, getting there. Violation number nine is that that was the stabilization without a barge. Again, we dispute that it was feasible to conduct this work, given the fact that, you know, the time of year, the water was low, there's no evidence to suggest that a barge could, in fact, um, do that work and be able to reach the areas, given um, the water levels. And finally, with respect to violations 10 through 12, the, this is with respect to tree removal and the point system and doing the work without a permit. The evidence supports the conclusion um, that the trees at issue here were largely hazard trees. We have evidence in the record um, where Mr. Gosselin indicated that. We also have evidence um, that the code enforcement officer himself says that the, the folks from Q team are trustworthy. There's no reason to not believe that what they are saying is, is truthful. Um, you have pictures showing clearly that one of the trees that was right next to the stairway, which was identified as a tree that was removed unlawfully, clearly this is a hazard tree, just like all of the other ones that were removed, or at least the, 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 the majority of them. And again, um, ultimately, these fr three violations all involve the same activity, removal of vegetation and trees, and therefore should not be um, should not be, they should be consolidated because they are not in true three separate violations. And that is it. I thank you for your time. And if you have any questions of me, I'm happy to answer them. So, Attorney Wagner, um, I have three yes, no questions for <laughs> two, two of the attorneys. And then, um, my thought is that uh, given the time that we work to, to potentially table these until tomorrow evening, that match your thought process? Yes. Okay. So uh, my three yes, no's, uh, Attorney Wyckoff, um, there was a document that came up uh, during one of the screen shares regarding the boat launch and a testimony by someone indicating that the boat launch had been expanded to 16 feet. Can you, I, I yes. have so much shock. Can you just simply provide that document to the board for tomorrow's meeting? Um, I have yeah. so much documentation here. I would just like to just have that single document available. Okay. For you, you have it. It's, it's a 249 page document that was yeah. provided by attorney Rachin today. And it's on yep. page 71 of the PDF. Print that out, David. Attorney Braun, uh, two yes, no questions. Uh, during your questions for Alex, uh, you had 
had some concerns over the tools that he was using, Google Earth, and the, to, as well as the tool on his phone. Again, just simply a yes, no answer question. Do you have any evidence that the tools that Alex used are inadequate for what he was trying to accomplish? So a little longer than a yes or a no. Now, as, I want, as, a, as I want to say, yes, I do. Okay, can you, if, can you provide that? Sure, in, in fact, you already have it in this exhibit F uh, that Alex included with his notice of violation. He himself indicated uh, that that document and the overlying lines that were included with it to ascertain or establish uh, tax maps were part of Google Map and Google Earth. Uh, and he also indicated that they were wrong and incorrect. Okay, is that the only evidence you have? Yes or no? Yes. Thank you. And. Finally, uh, do you have any evidence that Q team was contract contracted for use at 28 Whitetail? No. Okay. All right, that's it for my questions. I'll ask the board, do you have any last minute questions for these for our attorneys? I don't have any. I will, uh, I would like to, unless anybody objects, I would like to make a motion that we I table. Yeah, turning my card. I have, a proce I have a procedural question. Yeah, I don't think, I don't think any, uh, I don't think the public has had an opportunity. This is true. I, I, I think uh, Attorney Wyckoff is correct. So could we uh, just go through the motions of uh, asking if there's any members of the public who wish yeah, to speak? I can do that. <laughs> so, um, I will open up the public hearing portion to this. Do we have any members of the public that would like to speak in favor of this uh, application? Do we have any members of the public who would like to speak in opposition to this application? And then finally, do we have any members of the public who would like to just speak from a neutral perspective on this? Seeing and hearing none, I will go ahead and close out the public comment portion of this appeal. Uh, so before, I think you're in the process of a uh, motion to table, though, I guess I would suggest first we motion to close the public hearing and the record and then take up a motion to table uh, deliberations until tomorrow. Uh, so do I, I will motion that we close the public hearing and wrap up the testimony, something along those lines. I'm so tired too. Um, okay. Thank you. Close the public Thank hearing you. and close the record. Close the public hearing, close the record. Second. I'll second that. Thank you. Any further discussion by our board? All those in favor of doing so, David March, yes. Yeah. Greg Dean, yes. Tom Hennessy, yes. Fred Miller, yes. Good Lockwood, yes. Step is, uh, I'd like to make a motion to table our two appeals with regards to 28 Whitetail until our next meeting. I'll second that. Further discussion? All those in favor of tabling? David Merch, yes. Greg Dean, yes. Tom Hennessy, yes. Fred Miller, yes. Big Lockwood, yes. Uh, so we get to have fun tomorrow night, starting at six o'clock. Uh, just one question for you. Um, do, you do you have any other uh, business besides the parties that are here today? We do. We have another um, administrative appeal. Uh, that was... do, you have any, do you have any sense of how involved that one is? I just know I think that that uh, party got uh, pushed pushed away last meeting uh, because of uh, this group here. And uh, I just want to be respectful to uh, their time. And if it's a short, uh, if we think it's short, I might suggest trying to get them in first so that they don't have to sit through what I suspect will be another uh, another long night. Yeah, uh, understood. My sense is short, but uh, and I get a couple of other board members to chime in on that one. This is, uh, my, my thought 
without really knowing how long it would be was to deliberate on this first and then and then do that before we go into the other two just because the continuity makes it a little bit easier that would be my mm -hmm. only thought again i don't think the next one will take a lot of time and i'm okay with the deliberating first So I don't know. It's I mean it looks like it could be shorter, but um, I guess you just never know. So. I I kind of align with uh, Greg Dean that we just sort of continue on with what we started tonight. Yeah. Unfortunately, you know, they're just in, in the order that we come through them. So. It's my inclination, anyways. Okay. Okay. So I will make a motion to adjourn for this evening. No second. All those in favor, Dave Kermerch, yes. Greg Dean, yes. Ben Miller, yes. Dr. Lockwood, yes. Um, I can't hear you, but. Sorry, sorry, David. Go ahead. I, I got distracted for a second. Okay, we're adjourning. You good for that? Thank, thank you so much. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we will do this again tomorrow night. Have a good night, everyone. Good night. Thank, good night, everyone. Thank you for your time. Of course. Thank you.